broadcasting worldwide from a studio inside global headquarters of RP Enterprises in Kansas City. Kansas City. Hey, gang. Ladies and gentlemen, Papa's home. This is the Papa Ron Podcast. Bio transfer in progress. With Ronnie Phillips and Jillian Gray. Showtime. All right, we're back for another edition of the Papa Ron Podcast. And again, brought to you by for our friends at Brown Piercing Cattle Company. By the way, tonight for dinner, Jillian, is Smash Burgers. Smash Burgers on the Blackstone. What time should I be here? Uh, why don't you just hang out the rest of the day? <laughs> Looks like Everly's got some homework to do. She's yeah. going to watch some YouTube on the 85. Um, so Brown Piercing Cattle Company has incredible beef. They've been breeding registered Angus cattle for generations with one thought in mind, quality beef for consumers. Their goal is to deliver prime graded beef directly to customers' homes more affordably than you can purchase them at the store. Better beef conveniently delivered at a lower price than the grocery store. Find them online at brownpiercycattle.com. I am excited about, and I say this before every single uh, guest in every show, but I am really, really excited because I am a sports geek and uh, this guy, I mean, I'm telling you, like, you couldn't be in a better profession, I guess, at least in the fall or the winter, to be a sports radio talk show host than to be one in Kansas City of all places. Welcome to the Papa Ron Podcast, my friend, Nate Bucati. How are you, pal? Man, what an intro. That was awesome. Now you got me excited, too. I've been excited <laughs> well, the whole time. Well, I honestly. hope you're excited. You <laughs> yeah. drove all of this way to Global Headquarters RP Enterprises, you know, in yeah. Greenwood, Missouri. Um, what are you going to, are you going to hang for smash burgers too, or you might as well. Oh, you got to do Royals post game. Yeah, do go cover some Royals Fine. post game. Uh, so I w otherwise would, uh, would love to take you up on that. So Next the time. last time I've been, uh, in this part of the, of the Metro mm -hmm. was when I used to come visit Ryan Lefevre all the uh, time, who I know has been yeah. a, a, an honored guest on your show he before has. Yep. Mm -hmm. used to back in our days before we were both married with kids, hang out at his place all the time Yeah, at Lake Winnebago. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, yep. Yep. So anyways, it was and now he's just right down the road from yeah. here. See? Yeah. He's got horses and everything now, doesn't he? No, I didn't know that. I believe he does. <laughs> yeah. Holy cow. Yeah. When would he? Well, I guess he can do that. I, his the wife episode. has the horses, I think. Uh, is more appropriate. Yeah. Well, she needs something works. to do while right. he's traveling the <laughs> he's country. He's gone all the time. Covering the Royals. Um, man, thank you so much for being here. There's so much to cover. And as we alluded to, you've got to do Royals post game here this afternoon. So we want to get into the thick of it. But, you know, I guess we'll start, you know, how with how you and I met, um, which is kind of weird, uh, not weird. I guess what I'm trying to say is we met basically because I was a goo Do you even remember this? I was a, a goober fan hmm. of listening to sports radio okay. while I was still working at Q104. Okay. And I was still even doing nights. Okay. And oh, wow. yeah, yeah. And it was right after, and you're going to have to remind me his name, but he eventually got let go because he never showed up to work and was doing the morning show on 810. Johnny Renshaw. Uh, yeah. But what was, he had a nickname. What uh, was the freak? The freak. That's yeah. it. Yes. Yeah. The sports freak. And, and okay. so, uh, that was my introduction to sports radio morning show or morning show on uh, sports radio talk on more on a morning show. And, um, and he was, I mean, he was interesting when he was there and, but it was sh not very long that I had started listening to that when, um, Steven and Bob Fesco, yes, they started. And then that mm -hmm. was short lived. Mm -hmm. And then you came in and you were still on 810. I mean, you were in and you were doing yeah, a variety. I covering the Royals, traveling with the right. Royals at that time. Right, yeah. right. And so I, uh, after then you started, I sent you an email just randomly. Just say, hey, man, I love what you guys are doing. I actually work in radio also, working at Q104. And you fired an email right back and said that your wife was a big Pat Green fan. And yeah. she listened to uh, Q104. Do you remember this yes. now? Is it all yeah. coming? Yeah. And, and then so fast forward a little bit to... Um, I think it was the Big 12 basketball tournament. That's the first time I remember meeting you face to face. Right. Was yes. Big 12 tournament. Yeah. And we had so much, it's so much fun. That is like my mm -hmm. March, well, aside from September, <laughs> March is my favorite time okay. of year. Right. And I loved the energy in the Power and Light District for the Miller mm -hmm. Light Fan Fest. And so Nate and I got to work together and be on stage and do stuff together. And then we, when we're not on stage, we're back in the green room shooting the breeze and mm -hmm. he's a KU fan. I'm a K-State oh, fan. And oh. so, you know, we got to have those conversations. And, and so it was just a really cool experience. And from there, um, the relationship has grown a little bit with them giving us the opportunity to come on Sports Radio 810 and talk about the Heartland premiere, which, by the way, that is coming up this June. Let's so I'm going to be hitting you up to come back in. So just thank you for being a friend and, and um, 
uh, someone who has always been encouraging to me and uh, allowing us to uh, promote the, the Heartland brands on sports radio. It's really appreciated. Oh, and then the other part was the caveat is he was a uh, fraternity brothers with a guy from my hometown, Jake Wassenberg. Huh. Yeah. Jake was my pledge dad. Yeah. Wow. Uh, the, you know, you know, his hometown is famous as the, the home of the black squirrel, right? Did you know that? I didn't know that. Yeah. How do you not the know black that? Squirrel black squirrel festival even... and everything. Yeah, black squirrel. Yeah. Black. Uh, what do they call that? Black squirrel night or something yeah. like that, where it's on the Friday night before th- uh, Halloween. Yeah. It's a thing. Like it's a real, like there's a black squirrel. So. Oh boy. <laughs> See this, you're gonna get some good stuff from him, yeah. by having me on the show. That's maybe you, the, that's maybe you guys should here. interview me today. Yeah, let's go. Um, so apparently, so the railroad, the Union Pacific Railroad, comes okay. through Marysville. Okay. And apparently, many many moons ago, the train derailed, and it was a circus train. Is is the tale? Okay. And when the train derailed, then the car with the black squirrels got loose. <laughs> In Marysville, what? and now black squirrels, only black squirrels reside inside Marshall County, what? In, in particular Marysville, Kansas. That is, I don't know if that's Have you seen doing. one? The only oh, place. Oh, yeah, they're everywhere. Oh, they, okay. Well, they I didn't know if everywhere. they were like elusive. In fact, there was a time, and being the hunter that I am and as a kid with oh, a BB my. gun, oh, uh, it's illegal to shoot black squirrels. And I had snuck out the backyard back into the country and shot you were one. Poaching and I, black squirrels. And I got as a caught. Kid? I literally got oh, caught. Goodness. And a guy by the name of Joe Gonzalez threatened to call the police on me because <laughs> oh, no. I shot a black squirrel. <laughs> you got all these stuffed animals in here. Why don't you have a? You need to have a stuffed black squirrel. You know that would be. A I'm heck afraid of a, to go to jail. Yeah, that's true. That yeah, well, but that it's Missouri, so like I don't know. surely some have made I, I it to know. Missouri. I don't know. I don't know how the law works for pass ins and things. I just not going to risk it. <laughs> yeah. But I do feel I do feel blessed to know about Marysville. I've been to Jake Wassenberg's wedding was in Marysville. Okay. It's St. Gregory's Penny's Catholic Diner. Church. Or is there a Penny's, Penny's Diner? Yeah, we went to course. Penny's Diner late wow. at night. Yep. Uh, Where it, did you guys have the reception for Jake's uh, wedding? It had remember? to have been at like the VFW or something, right? I'm assuming uh, there's a VFW what? in Marysville. Uh, so it was probably the American Legion. Gotcha. Ah, it, uh, so Mine you know, my a VFW. okay, yeah. So yeah. my small town experience was Arc City, Kansas, and. Yeah. Uh, that was the best place to get a steak in Arc City, you know, and have a reception was the VFW. Yeah, so either American sure. Legion, VFW, something like that. I don't remember for they sure. They also have a Knights of Columbus yeah, Hall. Yeah, there you go. So yeah. <laughs> Marysville, the metropolis oh, yeah. of Marysville. So Nate Bucati has been there. Yeah. We wow. have uh, we have a lot of connections like that. You know, um, when I was in college trying to study to become a sportscaster, we had a, a guest lecturer named Mike McKenzie come in and talk to the students one day. Hmm. And he, uh, it's one of those moments you always remember exactly what he said. He said, if you want to go into this business to become rich or famous, <laughs> you're going to be sorely disappointed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you go into this business hoping to meet some of the coolest, most interesting people you'll ever meet in your life, you'll feel rewarded your entire career. Hmm. And... This conversation right here just comes to mind. You know, the the way the two of us met one another, yeah. working in somewhat similar career paths, but having mm-hmm. such different, you know, lives and all of that. Um, your life is the richer for it. You know, my life's for sure. richer for getting yeah. to know you. And, well, thank you. And it's fun to Likewise. be here. Well, wow. I'm glad that you're here. Um, what is it like right now? Be, well, <clears throat> let's back up a few months with everything that was going on in college football, then college basketball and the Chiefs. What is it like to be a sports caster in Kansas City? Like you're got to be on top of the mountain. It's a lot of fun. I mean, it's a lot of fun. Is because, it more work though? Well, yeah, for sure. Yes. And it's funny that you bring that up because we do sometimes sit around and talk about like, well, if the Chiefs win, awesome. Yeah. Parade, everybody's happy. If they lose, there's going to be a lot less work next week that yeah. we have to do. And that doesn't mean we're, you know what I mean? Like, but, yeah. so it's like, well, I'll take the positive whichever way it comes because I can't control the outcome of the game anyway. Yeah. So yeah, there's a lot more work with the NFL draft coming up. That's yeah. going to be a busy, busy week. And it's always one of those things where we talk about, man, I'm really excited about this. And I'm also really excited for it to be over, mm-hmm. you know, so that uh, there'll be some downtime afterwards. But uh I'll take it. You know, having covered when I first started in Kansas City, the teams were kind of bad at everything. Um, this is a lot better. Sure. <laughs> I'll take this. So, but what about 
I guess I look at it, what people may not understand who are listening and not familiar with the broadcast industry is that Nate has responsibilities beyond just showing up and sitting in the studio every single morning. Like we talked about earlier, needing to go out to Kaufman to do the post game today and you'll be on location to do various events, power and light during big 12 tournament. You're so you're bouncing around the city and it's not just those, you know, four hours that you're on the air in the morning. Um, but for those four hours that you're on the air, if the Chiefs do lose and then there is some downtime and you're not as busy, does it make it harder then to find things to talk about? I would imagine it does. Well, I think the toughest time on the sports calendar lately has been in the middle of the summertime when the Royals are out of it and the Chiefs aren't really playing. Um, when I think the month of June, my NFL calendar should be better implanted in my head by this point in time, but there's kind of a quiet time where Mm -hmm. the players can't, you know, they, they're mandatory. They have to be let go to do their own things. They, you know, they can't be forced to be around the facility. There's no real transactions happening in the league. And, uh, those days it is, it is a bigger struggle to figure out what are we going to talk about, we're going to fill four hours with. Honestly, though, I've I've started to come to the point where I look forward to those stretches because when it is football season now, you have to talk football almost the entire week, and that's twenty hours a week. Mm-hmm. Not that any of us ever really don't want to talk about it, but you know. The bigger challenge then is how are we going to keep talking about football without saying the same thing that we said for four hours yesterday Mm -hmm. until the next game comes around? And it just becomes like, you know, I believe variety is the spice of life. So, for example, when we get to have you guys come on, we don't spend a lot of time talking about waterfowl hunting, you know. Mm -hmm. And so now all of a sudden I get to talk to you and I get to learn something about something that I don't know as much about. Mm -hmm. Maybe we get a chance to talk a little soccer, which is a big passion of mine, and we don't get to talk as much about it on the morning show because that's not what the the bulk of our audience is interested in hearing. So I kind of look at it as a bright spot because we get to do some things that we otherwise wouldn't be able to do during football season because, you know, if we do something like that during football season, our our bosses are going to come down and knock on the door and say, (laughs) why are you not talking about the Chiefs right Uh now? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, it's all good. How long have you been doing the Border Patrol with Stephen St. John? Over 15 years now. Gosh, dang. Whoa, which is hard to believe. Really? Yeah, it's hard time to believe. That's a by. long time in talk radio, isn't it? Yeah. It doesn't feel like that, though. So mm-hmm. did that opportunity, did you feel like that that was something that you, did you have, you were already employed by 810, right? Yeah. So was it something where you had to go to Chad Boger and, you know, say, hey, I'm really interested in this opportunity? Uh, because uh, Bob had left to go take a position in St. Louis before yeah. he came back to go now be a, your competitor. Mm-hmm. Um, was there other people that were open for that job? How did that all come about? Um, or do you even remember? Yeah, that no, was so I, remember, long ago. I, I remember specifically how it happened because at the time I was covering the Kansas City Royals and they were on Sports Radio 810. That's right. And uh, 810 had the Royals rights for four <laughs> years and they lost 400 games during that four year pan- <laughs> wow. span. And when I was brought to 810 mm-hmm. at that time, it was to specifically be a guy that would travel with the team and cover the team home and away, which was an amazing experience for me as a young guy. I was in my, my 20s, my mid 20s at the time, hadn't really gotten to travel much um, in my life up to that point. And all of a sudden I got to travel all over the country and spend some significant time in all these different major cities and uh, really, really uh, loved that experience, but also kind of started to realize that maybe working baseball wasn't going to be my future. Yeah, Yeah. I just, man, baseball, it's every night. You're never home. You're mm-hmm. always gone. Even when you're home, you're not home. And when they're mm-hmm. losing as and much as they're, they're losing, losing that's you know, tough. The old adage that somebody told me was, you know, the great thing about baseball is there's a game every night. The terrible thing about baseball is there's a game every night. Every mm-hmm. night. Mm-hmm. And so I was I was figuring that out. And, and it was pretty clear to me that 810 was about to lose the Royals rights. Or they, they weren't even really trying to get them back. <laughs> because it, it, it just had been such a bad run. Yeah. Right. And they had overpaid for the rights to try to get them in the first place and all that. And so I I saw maybe there's a possibility if the Royals go to another radio station to work there. Um, Honestly, I was reluctant to join the morning show. Um, It was actually Aaron Swartz, who you remember was our producer at that time. And Stephen was doing the show by himself for a while. Stephen had gone through a a few different co-hosts in his roles at the time. After Bob? Um, No, uh, through Bob. Okay. And then they were they they really hadn't figured out who they wanted him to work with. And um 
Aaron came to me. We were actually at the Overland Park Athletic Club playing racquetball, okay. which is not something I mean, I, that probably <laughs> might have been the last time I played racquetball in my life. I don't even know why we were doing that. And he said, hey, man, I think you should co-host the show with Steven. And at the time, I was traveling with the Royals. And I said, I don't know, man. I never really wanted to be a talk radio guy. I always wanted to be a play-by-play guy. That was... Those guys were my heroes growing mm. up. That's what got me into wanting to be a sports broadcaster was Bob Davis yep. and Denny Matthews and Fred White and sure. Kevin Harlan. Like those sure. guys were my heroes. The ones that told you the stories of your sports heroes. Yeah. And I you know, talk radio. I don't know. I, I never, I never really wanted to be the, the hot take guy that's trashing the players or, you know, demanding this guy get fired and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I kind of had in my mind that that's what talk radio was supposed to be because that's what a lot of talk radio was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was like, man, I don't, I don't know. I, I'm doing this pre and post game stuff now. They're giving me a few opportunities to do some play by play stuff every once in a while with the Royals. And he said, look, I just think you and you and Steven would actually vibe well together. And he just hasn't been able to find a, a good, a good fit yet um, for, for, you know, to host the show with him. And really, honestly, I did it. I, I, so I, I, I said yes, because of the uncertainty of the future with the Royals, I didn't know if I would get an opportunity if they went to another radio station. Mm. I didn't know what my role would be at 810 once the Royals left. So it felt like, okay, this is a smart thing to do, at least get, make myself a part of something, see how it goes, and maybe they'll let me continue. To, and I was doing play-by-play -play for the KU women's basketball That's team right. at the time. And mm. 810 was always, like Chad Boger just has been amazing to me to let me chase these other dreams I have while doing stuff at 810 at the same mm -hmm. time. Um, and I'll always be appreciative of him for that because not every boss is like that, as you for probably sure. know. Oh, yeah. And so that's how it got started. And then 15 years later, um, you know, here we are. So And it, you're yeah, loving it. Yeah. Obviously, I mean, you're loving it, right? You know, Stephen, um, I feel like I'm working with the best sports talk radio personality in Kansas City. He's so good. And one of the best in in Kansas City history. The guy connects with the fans better than anybody I've ever worked with. He's the funniest. He's hilarious. I mean, he is just, he is just, you know, hilarious. And um, we vibe well together. I yeah. think we have the right number of similarities and yeah. the right number of differences that we, you know, we refer to each other as our work spouses a lot of times, <laughs> you know? And so... Jillian's had a couple of those yeah, in her day. You know how it goes. Yeah. You know, you spend that much time together. You have your little moments where you're annoyed with each other and things like sure. that. But, <laughs> but overall, I mean, for 15 years, it's been awesome. So I, I feel very lucky that Aaron Swartz came to me, and 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 he really pushed. You know, he's like, you should you should do this. So when you said that you said yes, was Aaron recruiting you for Chad, or was it just something that he that came to his mind? It was his I, personal thought, and then it got you inspired to want to go to Chad or whoever made the decision yeah. at that time and say, hey, you know what, I might want to give this a try. You know, I don't really remember exactly, and I wouldn't know the the discussions they had when I wasn't in the room. Well, sure. But it was Aaron that, t that came to me and he sure, it sure seemed like it was his idea. Okay. Um, and I think of course he, had, I think the biggest thing he had to do was pitch it to Steven and see if Steven was, was willing to, to give me a shot. Mm -hmm. And he was, you know? And so I think that the final decision was, was more Steven than anybody okay. else. Okay. And I think everybody else just wanted to see like, Hey, somebody that, that, that could work well with Steven that he likes, then let's give it a shot. So, you know, for the first year, you know, Todd Lebo was the guy that kind of helped. And he's kind of like our de facto program director. Yeah. And he said, well, you, you got to give up doing the, the Royal stuff, right? And I said, no, not for this year. I'll, I'll I, I didn't want to, I was kind of trying you don't to want to put all your eggs in one yeah, basket. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Maybe Stephen doesn't like me after six months. So he kicks me out. <laughs> right, you know, right. I don't, maybe I'm not any good at this talk radio thing. Um, you know, and, and so I, I, I did both. I did the night times covering the Royals and did the mornings. Wow. Um, and I, I, you know, I didn't have kids yet at that time. So I thought, well, this is a, this isn't one of those moments in my career, which by the way, I feel like I'm in another one of those moments right now it, it, where it's like, suck it up for a year and, and do both. Yeah. And that way you have an op, you have options. You can figure, you know, you're, you're mm -hmm. not going to get yourself just like stranded with, without a, without a boat in the ocean or whatever. I don't know. I don't know what the metaphor is. <laughs> yeah, I know what here. you mean. Yeah. I think it's stranded. I think there. it's stranded in a canoe without a paddle there or something go. like yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Creek without a paddle, something like that. I don't know. 
Um, <laughs> that is so funny. <laughs> Did you have a good relationship with Steven? Because here's what I wanted to say. Like <laughs> he's got a very strong personality Yeah. and, but he's got the heart of a teddy bear. Like he really is a big hearted guy, but it's good. It, he's not going to just in my, and this is just my own pers my 30,000 foot view from what I see from the outside, but he's not going to just be open-minded to just anybody who's going to fill that role. You've got to be the perfect fit. That glove's got to fit for you to, <laughs> you know, there's a really funny story and it comes up a lot on our show. I did not invite him to my wedding. Uh, <laughs> and that was after you took, took it, I had been doing the morning show for some time, but the invitations had already gone out. I think before we started doing the morning show together, <laughs> oh, no. um, I didn't think Steven really liked me very much before when Aaron came to me, you know, I thought he kind of tolerated me. Okay. Um, as you said, look, Steven is, uh, he does have one of the biggest hearts of anybody I've ever met. And, and all you have to do is see, see how involved he is in his children's lives. For sure. He, this man loves his kids and is dedicated, the most dedicated father probably that I know. And uh, that go, that just goes to show where his heart is right there. But I also think he, because of his upbringing and all that stuff, he is, he keeps a tight circle, mm. you know, and he presents, um, he presents an intimidating uh, exterior. Uh, I think, like I said, because of the way he grew up. Yep. And so, it's hard to it's hard to get in there, um, into his inner circle. And honestly, I think the harder you try, probably the less you're going to get in there. Mm -hmm. And I didn't try. I just kind of, hey man, you know, I'm not going to get in your way. Don't get, you know, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll leave you alone. Um, when when we're together, let's hang out, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and so yeah, so I kind of thought he didn't really like me that much. And so when we <laughs> when we were putting the wedding list together, we didn't invite him. And it's it comes up a lot. I bet. <laughs> it makes for awkward conversations a lot so of was, times. Was he? Uh, was he yeah. hurt by that? Yeah. Or, oh yeah. I think so. I mean, yeah. You know, I think he told, he went to Aaron. He's like, what's the deal? Does he not like me and everything? And then I was like, oh man. And by the time we figured it out, it was like, it was everything had been sent out. There was nothing to be done about it. And it's like, obviously a huge regret because I do think of Steven, I mean, for the record, one of the best friends that I have. For sure. You know, a person that... Um, and it comes across that way on yeah. the Yeah. I mean, we wouldn't be working together 15 years later. Exactly. If it wasn't the case. So it's it, it's hopefully just a funny story now. Well, now, yeah, I was going to ask that. <laughs> so it was a, it's a joke now. You guys have gotten past it. But did it come to a point where you had to have like a, hey, man, I'm really sorry. I didn't realize this was what was going on. And, and like, did, did you ever I, really have a heart to heart I've, about it? I know I've talked to him about it. I don't know if we ever had a sit down like, hey, right. let's hash this thing out. Okay. I, but... We definitely, I've said, look, man, you know, if I, if I had to do it over again and, and it's, it's funny because there were some other guys that did work at the radio station that I'm never was and am not nearly as close with mm. who got invitations <laughs> to the wedding. And I'm like, look, you, you can see right there that this doesn't have anything to do with how I feel about you and, and all that. So it's, uh, yeah, I think it's a funny backstory now. Time heals. Sure. Yeah. All that stuff. So when did you figure it out? That, because you talked about that kind of hard outer shell shell yeah. that Steven yeah. has. When did you kind of feel like, like you had a brother, you know, like, cause oh, it man. doesn't happen overnight. No. There had to have been some time together to really. Yeah. I, I, there's probably not some specific moment in time where it, like this epiphany hit me that this, this is one of my close friends, but you know, we, we honestly, I think when we really hit it off was we went to river falls, Wisconsin mm -hmm. to cover chiefs training camp together yeah and we had a deal with some car dealership that gave us like a camaro convertible or something to drive up there and his oldest son richie was who's a grown man now and sure. has his own career and all this yeah. stuff you yeah. know music business and everything was like in fifth grade wow and i pulled up to his house in the northland and he he came his mom was still alive at the time his mom came out and introduced herself to me she um she, it turned out she was from Wyandotte County, like me, she was an Onaveras. I went to school with some Onaveras. We kind of had some similar, you know, we, we knew some of the same people and we ended up, you know, you spend eight hours in a car together with somebody. His son, Richie came with us. He brought mm -hmm. his son, Richie with us. That's cool. And, uh, his, his youngest son, Phil, who's now in college, it's crazy to think was just a little toddler. And he came running out of the house, Richie don't go. And he was crying and it was tearing Steven up that we were going to leave his little son <laughs> mm. behind for the week. But when you spend eight hours in a car together, you end up talking. Steven kind of just told me the whole background of his, you know, his childhood and what his life was like, which helped me figure out right away why there was this 
this exterior that mm-hmm. was that was so tough. Mm-hmm. Um, and then and 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 I, he disclosed to me, and I don't remember when this happened, but I do remember him saying at some point in time. My background of growing up in Kansas City, Kansas, and some of the people that I had been around in my life, his uncle had been a police officer in KCK. My dad worked for the cops in KCK, so we knew a lot of the same police officers. We had been in a lot of the same type of juvenile mischief (laughs) (laughs) in the inner city growing up that he he felt like that gave me some amount of street cred compared to maybe some of the other guys that he'd worked with in the Mm. past. And he was like, this isn't some... I don't know, some, some spoiled punk or whatever. And, sure. and so I think he was willing to give me more of a chance than maybe some, some other guys he, that he would have worked with. Wow. So I, I don't know, but you know, it just kind of developed over time. Well, it, it will like, it's nothing that's yeah. going to happen overnight. It does take time, <clears throat> but I just, I love what you guys do. Um, I love the fact that your show isn't just a sports show. Like yeah. it, gender, it most, yes. I mean, it is a sports talk show, but there's a lot of real life stuff that you guys talk yeah. about and you address and, um, I, for me anyway, I, I personally connect with that better than some of the other, I'm not going to call it garbage. It's just different, uh, substance that is out there. So, well, I appreciate that. You know, I, I Steven really takes the lead on that because he has a great, one of the many things that Steven is so great at is he has a sense for what to talk about and when. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a huge component to doing live talk radio of mm-hmm. any kind. Uh, because that is what we're doing a podcast here. You know, podcasts are taking over a lot of the space now for your audio consumption. So where does live talk radio fit? And to me, you better be on point with what people want to hear More about right ever. now. Yep. You know, yep. And he just has a really good sense about it. And one of the things that Steven does to me when he directs those real conversations I don't think he's preachy about it. You know, I don't think he forces it down your throat. I don't think he looks for reasons to bring that stuff up. I think it's like when there's a natural point, something that's causing us to have this conversation right now, it's time to get real. He will get real, Mm. Yeah. you know, but it's not like, Hey, look at me. I'm going to get real serious today and let's get into it. You know? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that makes it more, uh, impactful when, when 100%. people hear it, you know, it's like, Oh, Steven's Cause it's serious raw. right now. It's yeah. raw emotion. Yeah. People resonate yeah. with that. I think, I mean, they, they connect with it. I know that I do. And so I, I definitely appreciate that. We're, we're going to get into kind of some deep stuff a little bit later in this show as it relates to you and, and me and Steven. Um, but I wanted to get, get, move on a little bit to, you talked about sporting Kansas city or power soccer being your passion. Before we started recording, Jillian had asked you how you kind of got involved with Sporting Kansas City. Um, that has actually kind of grown and developed over the last few years with what you're doing, uh, not only with them, but with Major League Soccer in whole, as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did the sporting games for eight years and loved every second of it. So how did that all come about? Because they had a play-by-play guy before you came yeah, in. Well, yeah, they had a couple. Um, Cal Williams was the guy before me. Um I had, I had, I hit this kind of epiphany in 2006 and I can actually tell you the specific moment on that when I was traveling with the Royals and I was getting a little burned out on the idea of baseball and just realizing that maybe this, this, at least at this point in my life, I was, I was get I had gotten serious with my girlfriend. I was starting to picture married life and kids and just the idea of, of never being home for seven months out of the year just wasn't, it wasn't working, you know? And, um, and also just, I don't know, it, I, I was I was kind of falling out of, of my passion for baseball at that level. And the World Cup was going on, and I was watching the World Cup every day. And I hit this epiphany that, man, this I think this is my favorite sport. Uh, and <laughs> I, I played a little soccer in high school, and that was about it. You know, I, I, I knew it a little bit, but I just got obsessed with it. And I started watching all these games in, in all these other countries. The global aspect of the sport really appealed to me as well. And so I... The owners, the new owners at Sporting Kansas City, the Wizards at the time, would hear me talk on the radio, little known to me, they were listening to the morning show too, and they would listen to me talk about how great soccer was and how we should go to the Wizards games. And they started kind of rolling out the red carpet for me a little bit and invite me to games. So I became a season ticket holder. And they would always take me out and show me the construction of the new stadium and things like that. And mm. so we, um, I would take my kids to the games. We went to the games in, in from 2010 when they opened the stadium, 2015. And then whatever happened between them and Cal, they, they weren't working something out. They, you know, they were going to go their separate ways. And mm. they came to me 
and asked me if I wanted to do the play by play. And, uh, was that because you, you, you referred to talking about soccer as much as you did on the border patrol, but you also had a background in doing play by play because you had done the women's. Yeah. I was still doing the KU women's games at that time. And I would do some soccer on the side, a little oh, bit, a oh, little bit, a okay. little, little bit here and there. No, I'd probably done less than 10 soccer games in my whole life before oh, yeah. they asked me. Wow. Um, but I'm one of those, I do genuinely believe that the biggest personal growth in your life happens when you get out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Um, it forces you to grow and, and really study and learn and, and, um, my wife actually was, I was a little hesitant, honestly, to take the job because I was doing KU women's basketball. We didn't know how soon it would be till Bob Davis was going to retire. Uh, I was doing the sidelines for KU football. That's and right. I, you know, I'm a fourth generation Jayhawk, love KU and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And everybody in my family really wanted me to hang in there and see if I'd have a chance to get that job uh, whenever it came open. And uh, my wife, who was also a Jayhawk, uh, said, you need to take that job. That job is the job you were meant to do. And, uh, so we did, we, you know, we took it and I didn't regret it for a second. It was the best eight years. I mean, I, I got to be the play by play guy for one of my, one for the team that I love the most in Kansas city for eight years. Um, I would have done it for the rest of my career. If the model hadn't got dis disrupted by the league, they, they took the local television broadcasts away from everybody and centralized it kind of the way the NFL does mm. where you get one broadcast for every game oh, around okay. the league now. And that's what I'm doing now for MLS and Apple and Fox, and um, which is a really exciting opportunity. But anyways, yeah, so I, um, I decided to make the leap and give it a shot. And it's funny, looking back on it, I thought I, I, thought I knew soccer well and was going to be good at it. And it's kind of <laughs> like, it's scarier looking back on it. Like, man, what was I thinking? <laughs> like how, how little <laughs> you did I know. I, yeah, like, exactly. And you're like, and I still did it? And yeah. they kept asking me back? Yeah. yeah, I was able to fake my way through it long enough, I guess. Hmm. Well, I mean, you did that for eight years. Eight years, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so this is the first year doing the TV. That's right. Are you yeah. liking that? I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Were it's, you were you as apprehensive about doing that as you were about starting doing play by play uh, about going to the national stuff? With mm -hmm. um, no, I I went after this with every every possible thing I had. Um, is that a significant? Um, what's the word I'm looking for? I mean, pay raise. Um. It's a pay raise. Okay. I don't, know, I don't know what defines significant, but it's, it's very, uh, like you're on high wire now, you know, yeah. like there's, mm -hmm. we're all on one year contracts. You know what I mean? Like okay. there's no, there's no job security. Uh, we're all, we're all on tryouts, you know? And, um, there is a scary part about that when you have three kids and, and, you know, people that are dependent on you and all that. But, uh, again, courage over comfort. And I just, I decided a few years, so I don't know how long of a story you want me to tell here. Go for it, man. Um, <laughs> I, I'm a, I tell long stories. That's but, okay. But, um, this so, is so, all about you, pal. So three, three years into, I, hopefully this will inspire somebody that's listening, even though- it, I love it, it. Take the soccer component out of it. Do the Ted Lasso thing where just forget the soccer part and just think about whatever your life is if you're listening yep. to this right now. Fill the blank in. So there was, a, there was a midfielder that played for Sporting Kansas City named Benny Failhaber. He okay. was one of the best midfielders in American history. He played at the World Cup. <laughs> he scored one of the greatest goals that the United States has ever scored against Mexico, their biggest rivals. And he helped Sporting Kansas City win MLS Cup in 2013. And I just revered him as a soccer player. He okay. just, just an artist on the field, mentally one of the most intelligent players you'd ever see and just gifted with the ball at his foot. And so, and a guy that loves to talk soccer. And so all of a sudden I'm doing play by play and for his games. And before the season, this was maybe after my sec, this was going into my third year, I think at sporting they, uh, the PR guy, Rob Thompson, said, hey, I want you to sit down with some of the guys and get to know them a little bit during preseason so that when the season starts, you have a good rapport with them. So Benny Failhopper comes to my hotel room, and we're just, he just like, we're supposed to hang out for an hour, just talk. Mm -hmm. And uh, right at the start of the conversation, he says, hey, how come you're not doing national stuff? And I said, well, I don't know, man. I just started doing <laughs> soccer like two years ago. I'm trying to see if I can do this, really. I'm just mm -hmm. trying to prove to myself that I, that I belong here in the first place. And he said, well, I watch all the games and I watch all the other guys and I think you're as good as the, as the network guys and I don't think you should sell yourself short. I think it seems like a bit of a cop-out to me. 
Wow. And I mean, coming my, from him, yeah, this guy coming you admire, from him, yeah. you know, and and so that gave me the confidence to reach out to Fox, and I and I reached out to the number one play by play guy, Fox John Strong, and said, man, I don't even know where to start. I've never tried to get a network job in my life. I've been in Kansas City my whole career, and I had gotten to the point where I was pretty much good with being in Kansas City. This is where I was born and raised. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go anywhere else. And um, he said, well, here's the guy that's a contact at Fox. This is who you should talk to. And I started getting some opportunities at Fox. I, you know, I've, been, I've been doing games for them on a fill-in basis for three or four years, three years now, two, three years now. And um, – I set for myself the goal of trying to get on the World Cup roster. And I missed out on the World Cup roster this past year, like uh, from what they told me anyways, very closely. Wow. I was at least considered for the position, which I felt honored, but also, sure. you know. Disappointed. But yeah. So like, you know, I want to I want to be on the World Cup roster when the when the World Cup comes to Kansas City. That's my that's my goal. And I want to give everything I've got. I want to put myself in every ad advantageous position to get there. I want to I, I want whether I make it or not. When the World Cup rolls around, I want to be able to look back and say, I did everything I possibly I love could, this. you know, to have a chance at it. And that might mean taking risks. That might mean getting out of my comfort zone again. Mm -hmm. But so as soon as this thing happened with Major League Soccer and Apple and Fox, I did everything I could to be a part of it. I wanted to do everything I could to be a part of it. So, no, there was no... Well, that's this one of the stepping one, stones yeah, to kind of get there. Yeah, this was not one where they came to me and I was like, I don't know. This was more... What, how can I get this job? How can I get this job? If anything, I might've been too aggressive. I yeah, don't know. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's how that went down. Yeah. So how does Jillian then become a sideline reporter for uh, the world cup? Because I'm thinking yeah. that might be something in the future. I don't yeah. know. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> what a massive hey. soccer fan she is. I yeah, think, you know, I mean, it's, it's the sport I know the <laughs> least about. It really is for me too. Really I, yeah. I, um, I'm not going to lie. And, and I admire you so much for your passion for soccer and and you I, it, it it just oozes through the speakers when i'm listening to you and steven talk about it and i want to care mm -hmm. because i'm a kansas city guy right and i'm yeah. passionate about everything else that's sports right. related in kansas city and and i want sporting kc to do well right problem is is that i didn't grow up around soccer sure you know not like yeah. we did with basketball and football in yeah. a small town in northeast kansas you know, it seemed like all of the soccer things were happening in the bigger cities because mm -hmm. you were playing soccer in high school, right? And you were I, about I did the my same junior, age. senior year, yeah. But even at my high school, our coach was reading out of a textbook. He didn't. He but you, didn't, but you at least had a team. We didn't yeah, even have a team. Yeah, but we didn't know what we were doing. And <laughs> and honestly, and our athletic director made us play at a public park because he didn't think soccer was a real sport. You know, it was a sport that the sissies who couldn't play football played. That was how they viewed it. Yeah, you know, at that time. That. Um, yeah. And I, I do I think. Can see that. <laughs> Did anybody? I, nobody, I, nobody, didn't, I, didn't, yeah, I no. didn't mean it the way it came across. Yeah, I can, I can see, see that, that that's what the yeah. persona was. Yeah, I can yeah. see that people would treat that's, it like yeah. that. Yeah. It's yeah. not yeah. how I treat it. But Ronnie I do think thanks, that Jillian. Exactly what you spoke to. And that's something that Peter Vermees, the head coach at Sporting, told me. When I sat down to take the job, he told me, you have a really important job yeah. because in this country, our biggest problem is the average American doesn't know what's going on in this game. Yeah. They watch it and they see 22 people jogging around, kicking a ball for no reason. Yet those same people who might not have ever played a down of tackle football in their lives, watch a football game and they feel like they understand what's happening. And that's because the announcers are educating them on the game at all times. They're drawing diagrams. They're showing replays. They're explaining yes. everything that's happening that to you. That is so true. And he said that, in America, we didn't have announcers who understood the game of soccer well enough uh -huh. to explain it to you in a way that made you understand what was happening. They just would take a play-by-play -play guy from another sport and drop him in, and then they would try to kind of call the game, and they were afraid to get too technical about any of it because they didn't understand the game well enough. And, and, I, and I really honestly, Peter Vermees, he sat me down. I've spent I don't know how many hundreds of hours over the eight years him teaching me the game of soccer. You know, and I thought I knew the game, and now I know enough to know what I don't know, honestly. Mm -hmm. But he educated me so much on it because he felt like that was a big component, and I think you're a perfect example. You know, if, if, if the next kid, like Ronnie, grows up feeling like they understand the game, then the game's more, every sport's more exciting if you feel like you understand what's going on. I feel the same on. way about ice hockey. Right. I mean, hey, I feel that way about hunting. 
I've yeah. never been hunting in my entire life. I know, and life. I keep You're telling you I'm going to take you. <laughs> but I, and I'm <laughs> sure I all. would be fascinated by it, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. But I remember being, t- you know, I, I went fishing a few times and I lived in Ark City. Mm-hmm. And I was like, so this is what we do? We sit, we sit around here and... Wait for wait, a fish to bite. Wait for something to happen. <laughs> you know, and, and, and then like, you know, now that I'm older and I have like my cousin's like a massive fisherman and, he, yeah. and, and when he describes all of the reasons it's such a wonderful thing to do, I'm like, I want to go fishing with you. Yeah. You know, so I yeah. think it's, it's, it's the same way with any, any person. I would like to, um, and this, and really it's, it's on me. You know, it's nobody else's fault. It would require me to actually invest the yeah, time not, to no, learn. But, but you're, no one's under the, this is entertainment. No one's, it's no one's obligation. To I like see, to be entertained. Yeah. But, 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 but you, you know, it's not your obligation to go educate yourself on something to get yourself entertained. You know, if, if hopefully somebody myself or somebody else could suck you in to make you interested enough yeah. to start to find out, but that's, you have a million other things going on, man. Sure. It's like, uh, and it's everybody fu- can't love everything. So 100%. like there's, pe- there's yeah. people that love to read books <laughs> and I'm like, that's amazing. I, <laughs> Would love to love yeah. that, but I don't love that. Yeah. So if I yeah. if somebody's like, oh, this is a really great book and it's a great, you know, I'll be like, do they have an audio book? Because that's yeah. I, just, I don't I don't want I, like I can read obviously I just don't yeah. love it I get sure. distracted yeah. I get bored I get yeah. So like it's funny because whenever we have these conversations I have this kind of conversation a lot of times with somebody who says hey I'm so I just don't really know anything about soccer yeah you don't you don't owe me an apology yeah you're you're under no <laughs> obligation to like it whatsoever <laughs> now I'll I. If you want to make fun of it and act like it's not serious or legitimate or does right. isn't worthy of your consideration, that'll that'll bother me a little bit mm-hmm. because that's you know any any pursuit you know if you do that to something that somebody else cares about, it's just mm-hmm. being disrespectful, right? Yeah. But th- just because you don't know it or care about it or love it doesn't mean you're being disrespectful. That's just yeah. That's okay. Your so taste, so you know? then I'm going to challenge you and and potentially ruffle your feathers a okay. little bit because it's not my intent to do that. But this is the issue with what little I know about soccer that bothers me. There's two things. I have one of those too. So we'll see. Right, let's we'll go. See. Fire, yeah. them, okay. fire like a away. Stereotype and and I understand yeah. that okay. the MLS and the FIFA and they're they're all have different rules and things, but I absolutely, one hundred percent with every m- muscle in my body cannot stand the idea of playing for a tie that bothers me big time. There's a winner, there's a loser. Otherwise I just wasted my time watching guys running up and down the field to play for a tie. I can't stand that. Now tell me why I shouldn't feel that way. Well, I think um, if you use, or give me some insight, maybe not how I should feel that way, but how, give me some insight. Well, this is the way I would put it at the end of whatever competition you're in, whether it's the league or a tournament, there is one winner. At the end of the day, that's what we're playing for here, right? Like, if I watch a Chiefs game, I don't care if they won or lost game five of the season. I care if they won the Super Bowl. Yeah. And there can be ties in the NFL. They're very rare, but they do happen. Mm-hmm. But And I'm going to walk away from that game pissed off if it happens. Yeah, but, uh, like, to me, okay. Not pissed off. It, that's there's, extreme. But. There's a, but, like, that result is a result. It's not as good as a win, and it's not as bad as a loss, and it's going to affect where you stand when you get to the playoffs and whether or not you have home field advantage throughout the playoffs. Okay. The result matters. Yeah. And so for me, like it's like you know the old analogies of, of, of losing a battle but winning a war. Mm-hmm. Some battles are wins, some battles are losses, some battles are stalemates. But there's a winner at the end of the war, and there's a loser. And the way I look at it is through the course of it, you're, if you don't win enough games, you're not winning the title. Right. And, and there's nuance. I like nuance in life and I like nuance in sport. Some wins feel like some, some draws feel like wins. Some draws feel like losses. And it all depends on the mm. circumstances of the game. If you're playing against the best team in the league on their home field and three of your players are injured and you can just grind and grind and make yourself a defensive stalwart and hold them out of goal and get a point on the road, you come home going, we got something today. Mm-hmm. You but know? Nate, you would have to understand the game to get that yeah. sensation. Yeah. And this is why I don't like it. Because if for somebody like me, who, which let me back up a little bit, everybody tells me, if you don't know what you're missing until you go to a sporting Kansas city game, I've it's that, yeah. so much energy and it's so incredible. And I'm like, and of course I'm open-minded to trying new things. I'd love to go, but then I see how many times, and again, I'm an unge- uneducated soccer person. So I, <laughs> does that even make sense? I'm an, unde- I'm uneducated on soccer. So I like the celebration in sports. 
Somebody shoots a deep three and they hit it. Last you know, second shot. You know, the celebrations mm-hmm. throughout the game. I enjoy that about sports. Yeah. Now I'm a person who doesn't understand all of the celebration that takes place and potentially having a tie because I don't understand the game. Wouldn't it be open the door to potentially introducing the sport to more fans if they had the ability to understand that there's a winner at the end of each game? Because there's a lot of ties that happen in MLS. <laughs> so uh, you see where my, I'm going my, with that? My Ron reaction. is acting like, like you actually have the authority to well, do this. Like he can talk you into changing no, this. My, my stance well, yeah, on that he's is on a national maybe level now. if we enacted these changes, we could turn soccer into the most popular sport in the world. It already is, isn't it? Oh, yes. right. It is. No, but, <laughs> I was going to say, I, so I don't think the ties are the problem. Yeah. But, but is that, and, and again, I'm asking out of ignorance, is that the rule in all of the different yes. leagues throughout? Yep. It is. Yeah. Okay, but yep. so World Cup comes around, a game can end in a tie? Oh, yeah. Now, again, what I, what I go back to is whatever the competition is, there's a winner and a loser at the end of the competition. Right. So at some point in time, the ties have to go away. So like in the World Cup, when you play group stage games... That's like, so you start what does off. does that mean? Okay, so in the World Cup, you start off in a group of four teams. Okay. And, the, and everybody plays everybody. So you play three games, one against the three other opponents. The top two teams in, the, in, in terms of points go on to the knockout rounds. So if you win a game in the, world, in the group stages, you get three points. If you draw, you get one. Ah. So, you, you know, so, the, so it depends on what the circumstances are. You could really need to win to get on to the next round. Mm-hmm. Now, once you get to the knockout rounds, one team is advancing and one team's going home. Mm-hmm. And in those games, it goes to extra time. They play 30 minutes of, of, of overtime, but what they call it extra time in soccer. And then if it's still tied, they go to penalty kicks. Okay. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people gripe about penalty <laughs> kicks because it's like, well, that's like deciding a basketball game on a free throw shooting contest at the end, you know, mm. but soccer is a kind of sport where goals are hard to come by. Mm-hmm. And so you could play and, and, and you're running upwards of nine miles, start and stop sprinting and all that for 120 minutes. You're running upwards of over 10, 12 miles. You just can't go for that long. You have to, at some point they go down to penalty kicks. So, right. yeah. So no, and, and when you get to, when you get to playoffs and things like that, there are no draws. Those only happen in, in the kind of regular season components of games. And, and again, it's about racking up points. You know, the team with the most points at the end of it is going to be the team that wins or goes on to the playoffs. Very well said. That, that was a so, good rebuttal to yeah. my argument. The other thing that I don't like, was first of all, was that yours? No. The thing I don't okay, like? All right, so no. here's number two, and we'll see if it's yours. <sighs> the flopping. The flopping, oh my gosh. Like, I can't, I've, I've, now again, I've tried to watch, my brother-in-law loves Sporting KC, uh, excuse me, Sporting Kansas City, loves soccer in general, and I've sat down and watched it with them, and then when I see these guys basically barely get touched and they flop like Marcus Smart, mm-hmm. who is the biggest flopper in college basketball, um, I'm just like, and then they sit there and they act like they just blew an ACL, until the guy throws the card up or whatever, and then they stand up, then mm-hmm. they just run like nothing ever happened. Mm-hmm. That's so annoying to me. I have zero rebuttal to you on that. I hate it. I think it's the worst part of the game. In fact, college um, basketball actually started enforcing a rule that you couldn't flop, Yeah, and I would love to see that. If, if that was put in, I might take the sport a little bit more seriously. But college basketball has the ridiculous charge foul where people jump in front of somebody and then fall over when they're not even trying to play defense. So we, my, my so you hate the charge call altogether? I, I hate the way it's implemented in college. I think it's an absolute farce. It, okay. it, it encourages not playing defense. Jumping in front of someone and falling over is not guarding someone. That's true. I hate that. Okay. But And, and, and so here's the, my, my only defense is you're right but every sport has things about it that drive me crazy. And the sports are usually, and I love pretty much every sport. I'm willing to overlook the things I hate about those sports and I'm tall and tolerate them because the sport is so great. Flopping sucks. It's terrible. I I wouldn't even mind it if it was on a minimal level, but it's so, Oh, I mean, incredibly significantly exaggerated. I don't even, it doesn't bother me if a guy tries to sell a foul. Exactly. I mean, we see flopping in the NFL now. Quarterbacks flop all the time, right? If somebody even comes close to a quarterback, they <laughs> fall down and they point at their knee yep. and they want to flag. So it's, it's, but what I hate is the faking of injuries. Yes. That, that's where in soccer you get guys that fake injuries and they stop the play of the game and everybody has to stop and stand around and pretend. And it's, first of all, it's a boy who cried wolf because soccer is a sport that actually has a lot of very serious injuries. Broken legs, mm-hmm. broken yeah. ankles, torn up knees, mm-hmm. and concussions happen 
happen all the time in soccer. And and to me, you're disrespecting all the guys that really get hurt. Yeah. I grew up playing American sports where you were supposed to not show that you were hurt mm -hmm. because then you're showing a sign of weakness to the other team. So I'm with you. I don't like it. I think there's some things they could do to to get rid of it or at least to minimize it. But unfortunately, the the world of soccer has has, has kind of encouraged it because they reward it. You know, mm -hmm. they reward it. And um, I'm with you. I, I don't like it at all. I don't okay. think it's a good thing about the sport, and I won't try to defend it. But I think that everything else in the game is so wonderful and beautiful mm -hmm. that I'm willing to put up with it. I want to get with Jilly and what her issue was with it. But I wanted to also say that I do know that soccer is the most popular game in the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it can't be the most popular game in the United States. And I think that if it would introduce or potentially open the door, or am I wrong? Am I wrong in assuming I that? I don't think it will in my lifetime anyway, because we didn't invent it. Fair enough. We, but we could invented it basketball, baseball, and football, and we have a monopoly pretty much on the major leagues in that sport. That's fair. But could it relate to the game in soccer? But could it open the door to introducing it to more if we what, talked with, with some of the things that we discussed here. What they found in Major League Soccer through the first 10 years, the league was struggling and shrinking and it wasn't going to make it because they tried to Americanize it. They put penalty shootouts in after every game. Okay. They did exactly what, so there weren't any ties. They did all these different types of things to try to Americanize it and it never caught on. Okay. Then they started actually joining the world of soccer and, and, and they come up with names like Sporting Kansas City yeah. and Inter Miami and all this stuff. And they started bringing in other players. For, they became a well-respected league across the world. Okay. And now they're, you know, the franchises are selling for $400 million. And it's continuing they're, to grow. There's there more people go to Atlanta United games than Atlanta Falcon games. Wow. I don't think it's going to pass. I don't, it's never going to come close to the NFL in my lifetime. Could it pass baseball? I don't think that's, that's that far fetched. Wow. But what they, what, what I think they figured out was there's nothing wrong with the sport of soccer at all. It's the fact that we've never had it or been good at it in this country. And in this country, people want winners. Mm. They, we, you know, America loves a winner. That's what Patton said, right? Yeah. And, and, and until the United States gets to the point where they show they can compete with the best players in the world, most Americans are going to be a little dismissive of it. That, I think, is the bigger problem than whether or not there are ties or flopping. That's very well said, Nate. I appreciate the explanation. Wow. So what's your issue with soccer? Well, my, I don't, it's not an issue. It was just the stereotype, and I didn't know there was a name for it. So mine was flopping, but I didn't know that ah, it was called that. I okay. wrote down fake injuries yep. because that's what I hear. Like, So there's a little Mexican restaurant we go to, and they always have soccer on. Mm -hmm. right? I think that's the only channel they subscribe to. <laughs> Is it like the Telemundo? The Telemundo channel? And like, but that's what I, I'm like, oh, look. And that's what, because I don't know anything about soccer. Yeah. And so it's kind of like watching a NASCAR race for a wreck. I'm, I like, will look when there's... You know, when there's the, a flop. Now I know there's a flop. I didn't so, know it was a name. You know, one thing that actually really drives me crazy about it too is when you when you so in America, soccer has has developed as kind of a rich kid sport, right? Mm. Mm. It's it's pay to play. Uh, it's out in the suburbs. That's where you see this. I live out in Overland Park, and the soccer fields are just filled up with kids playing and everything. Yeah. Everywhere else in the world, it's an inner city. Uh, oh. it, in, in fact, they used to, the, the the adage in England was always that rugby is a gentleman's sport played by. A, a, a thug sport played by gentlemen. Mm. Soccer is a gentleman's sport played by thugs. That's oh, what they say in England because wow. all the kids are inner wow. city, inner city street Never kids. Never heard that. The guys that play <laughs> soccer from Mexico, from Brazil, from Argentina, from almost every other country in the world are some of the toughest street kids you've ever met growing up in the favelas of Brazil. And yet they give off this sense of that they're really soft. And 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 what <laughs> how it was explained to me okay. uh, by some people in the in the world of soccer is they want to win so badly mm -hmm. that they don't care if you think they're a sissy. They ah. don't care if you think they're soft. They don't care if you think they're dirty or cheap. They will do whatever it takes to get every advantage over you possible. Including flopping. Including flopping. Okay. Including trying to elbow you so that you will hit me and then flop so that you get a red oh. card. Dirty little tricks like that. Okay. And, and, and I'm not condoning that, but it, it did kind of put a different spin on it in my mm -hmm. head. It's like, uh, I'll stoop to whatever means necessary to win this game against you. Okay. And and that's kind of the mentality of the players that have a tendency to do that. That that sounds kind of like, because we were talking before we started recording about wrestling as well, because mm -hmm. that's my favorite sport. So, no, I did never do it, but it's like the, the boys especially that get made fun of for wearing a singlet, mm -hmm. right? And they're like, oh, you're going to wear that that singlet, that onesie, that mm -hmm. you know swimsuit or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they're like, they know they're tough enough that – 
you can make fun of my single all you want. Let's get on the mat. Yeah, you know? let's, yeah. Wear what right. you want and let's go. Yeah, call so, me whatever you want. I like that. That's good. Wow, that's some good stuff. Interesting. All right, we're going to take a little break, and then when we come, when we, whoops, I hit the bell. No, that was right. When we come back, I want to um, I want to get some of Nate's favorite moments uh, in covering sports in Kansas City over the last 15 years, and maybe some of his not so favorite moments. All right. Yeah, you I think you got a few least, of those? Your least favorite sport, too. Your old least I favorite sport. Least well, favorite it sport. might be hunting. <laughs> 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 it's coming up when we come back with Nate Bikandi on the Papa Ron podcast. You're listening to the Papa Ron podcast. Welcome. Keep up to date on new podcasts, discussion topics, and future guests. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Search Papa Ron podcast and be sure to like and leave a comment. Now back to the show. Here again are your hosts, Ronnie Phillips and Jillian Gregg. Hey, did you check out this new hat? My new lid that I got on. Have you seen me? You haven't well, seen I me wear see this. It. I haven't yeah. seen you wear yep. that. No. I got a new gig. I got a new gig. Dell's Power Sports in Grain Valley. And the reason I bring that up is because they got a really cool product called Clean AF. Clean Polish Protect, specifically formulated to protect and beautify surfaces, including plastic, vinyl, rubber, and carbon fiber. Water-resistant formulation is safe for use on gloss and matte finishes and makes the cleanup process easier by forming a durable coating that repels mud, dirt, and debris. Apply lightly, buff to a dry sheen. Perfect for all power sports enthusiasts. Check them out online at cleanabsolutelyflawless.com or in Grain Valley at Dell's Power Sports. Your favorite moment in Kansas City sports as a broadcaster for Sports Radio 810 over the last 15 years. Nate Bucati. That's tough, I bet. So I'm going to go with the weird one. A little off I the like wall. I like weird. One. Because, I mean, easy ones would be Royals winning the World Series. Yeah. Uh, uh, Chiefs winning the Super Bowl, yep. Sporting winning the MLS Cup, KU winning the national championship. Yeah, that's the right answer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I knew he was going to throw a jab yeah, in eventually. You know, no, th- those um, those would be all some great ones. But for me, just from an individual standpoint, uh, when I went, when I first started, I told you at Sports Radio A10, I was brought over to be the guy that was going to cover the Kansas City Royals and travel with the team. Yep. And I was going to be the first guy ever to do on-field interviews with players as they were coming off the field after the game was over. <laughs> oh. And this was a big deal um, that, you know, 810 had come up with and, and you know, got the Royals to sign off on. And the Royals, in two, this was going into the 2004 season. In 2003, they had had that miraculous year they went 83 and 79 with Tony Pena and they we thought they were going to build on it the next year and go to the playoffs and they had brought in Benito Santiago Mm -hmm. and and Juan Gonzalez and so optimism going into that opening day was sky high and it was a huge deal for in fact it was that the one they won where Beltron hit the home run hit the walk-off home run Mendy Lopez hit like a three-run home run to tie the game if I remember correctly in the bottom of the ninth and Beltron hit the walk-off home run to win yep yep Jose Lima was pitching then too wasn't he yes yes And so um, that was my first home game okay. for 810 and the Ra- Royals Radio Network. And I was in the dugout getting ready to interview somebody if the Royals won the game. And it was opening day, so the place is going crazy. Everybody thinks the Royals are going to win and go to the playoffs that year. And, uh, and for 810, it was a big deal because it was a locally owned radio station. To get the rights to a Major League Baseball huge. product was yeah. a huge upset and a coup for them. And so mm-hmm. this was a big deal for the radio station too. And so um, Beltron, and I had developed a really good relationship with Carlos Beltron. He actually cool. was probably, uh, he was my favorite player to cover the whole time I was with the Royals. Him, Desi Relaford, and Mike Sweeney probably. Desi Relaford. Uh, Desi Relaford. I named my dog after Desi Relaford. Really? Man, we hit it off big time <laughs> over a shared love of Aww. old school hip hop music actually. Okay. But anyway, Run DMC? Yeah, all that stuff. Wow. What was the other wow, guy you wow, said? Wow. Uh, uh, Mike Sweeney. Mike Sweeney, of course. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's it. That's it. You know, everybody loves Mike mm-hmm. Sweeney yeah, and everything. Right. But Beltran was always great with me. Um, and, and so... He's at home plate getting mobbed, and I felt comfortable enough as soon as the mob kind of broke up to get out there, and I had my microphone, and we did an interview on the field right after the game, and he was great, and it went out over the air, and everybody uh, seemed to you know love it. Everybody was on cloud nine. The Royals are going to be – they went on to lose 100 games that right, year, by the way. Right. But that in that moment in time, it was just this huge moment, and Larry Moore, like the oh, most yeah. legendary newscaster in Kansas City history. KMBC Channel 9, by the way. He – sent me a handwritten note that I still have to this day saying that was one of the best moments of sport jur- sports journalism I've ever heard in Kansas City. What? You did an outstanding job. The funniest part of it was he addressed it to Nick. <laughs> 
Nick, <laughs> you did this interview and it was great. And I, Larry Moore's son and I've had a lot of, I guess I've told the story in the air a few times and Larry's heard it and he feels like terrible about sure. it. And the point is not to make him feel terrible. No. Because it was like the coolest thing ever. I don't care that he called me Nick. Right. That, the fact that, because I was like 24 six years old at the time yeah, and just kind of get that was the first real gig in my career that I felt like I was like I'm a real sportscaster you know it was like getting a Bill Snyder written letter yeah yeah (laughs) see what I did there so I slipped that in very similar (laughs) did he call you the right name hey Rick nice job I haven't gotten that letter yet you could have lied if you told me you got one Um, I got a couple autographs but Bob Davis got a handwritten note from Bill Snyder when he got into the Kansas Association of Broadcasters Hall of Fame and that's Bill Snyder right there. Yeah. The play-by-play voice of the Kansas yeah. Jayhawks got a handwritten letter from Bill Snyder saying congratulations. I know we're getting off topic here, but Bob Davis is a legend. Class and as much as, as much as I love mm-hmm. K-State, and if you're a K-State fan, you typically very much dislike KU, mm-hmm. but Bob Davis was, all, I mean, one of the best ever. Yep. In my personal opinion, as, yeah. a, as a play-by-play broadcaster, um, I felt sorry for... Um, Oh, gosh dang it. Haney. Brian Haney. Yes. Yep. Because those are huge, huge yeah. shoes to feel. And I felt the same way when Mitch Holtis left to go to the Chiefs. You know, sure. um, Greg Sharp, Wyatt Thompson. I mean, great. They've all been great, by the way. Everybody great, you just mentioned has been really great, good. But yeah. those, those those were my guys, yeah. you know. Like, even, yeah. by, even though I didn't like KU, I loved hearing Bob Davis call a game. He was so good at it. Those, it was just really hard to fill those shoes. Sorry, I got off topic there, but yeah. that was your moment. That was, was yeah, your favorite. I just thought I'd give you something different than just the yeah. typical, you know. Okay, so the um, the most, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The Dislikeful moment in sports. Like something that really just burned you. Well, the stat sheet flap, you know. I had it written um, down. I was yeah, going to bring it up. I mean, up. That, that was, you know, that was the most... So you got to explain it because Jillian doesn't know. I have no idea what you're talking about. You know, it's funny because my wife always says, if you want people to stop talking about it, you got to stop talking about it. But we're, you know, we're being real here. And that's the thing. I I don't want, if you, I don't know if you've listened to any prior podcasts, but this podcast is intended to be vulnerable, to pull back the curtain, get behind the surface and and share something. And you and I had a moment when all of that happened. And so I'll never forget it. Yeah. So I'll never forget it. So go ahead and share what happened. I was, uh. K-State's uh, playing at, at Allen Fieldhouse. It's a K-State KU basketball yeah, game. Yeah, okay. it was like Big Monday or something like that. And uh, the owners of Sporting Kansas City had offered me their seats that were right at the, the front row, press row. It used to be press row. Now, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the high money alums can buy seats there to take my color commentator. He had never been to a game at Allen Fieldhouse before. So that's mm-hmm. why they gave me the seats. They yeah. want you to take Matt to the game. and He'll see what it's like. It was a guy from England had never been to Allen Fieldhouse. So that's why we were sitting there because I had done the play by play for the KU women's basketball games for 14 years. I, I'm one of those people. I, I make friends with all the, the ushers and everything around there, you know? Yeah. And so at every media timeout, they would go and hand stat sheets to the members of the media that kind of updated the stats from the last four minutes of the game. And the old, the usher that I had known for a long time saw me sitting there next to the, the, the press seats. And just to be nice, he would give me a stat sheet every four. So I had a pile of papers in front of me. It's just crazy. The set of circumstances that led to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, K state was going to win the big 12 that year. And it was a big, so the rivalry was, you know, when, when both teams are good, uh, you know, tensions are higher and all that. Mm-hmm. And KU was winning the game and it was late in the game. It was like, yeah, I, I don't even remember what the score, but it was, they were up 10 points or something like that. And Xavier Sneed uh, for K-State came diving out of bounds to catch a loose ball. Mm-hmm. And he landed on myself and my buddy. And we kind of caught him and, you know, helped him up. And, and, and of course this part, nobody ever saw, but we clapped for him and said, Hey man, good, good effort, you know, good mm-hmm. hustle. And when he got up, he had put his hand on the table and he had a stat sheet stuck to his hand. And he, he walked over and just kind of handed it to me. And me being the smart ass that I am, thought I would, was being funny and make him laugh. And I turned her stat sheet around and I said, hey, man, you need to look at this. You guys are getting out rebounded by eight or whatever mm-hmm. I said to him. And I kind of shook the stat sheet at him, like, you know, you know, t- taunting him, yeah, basically. Yeah, sure. And in my mind, it was playful trash talk. You know, it, he would laugh, I would laugh. Yeah. But it was right there on camera. 
and everybody saw it. And what they see is this arrogant jerk KU fan taunting a, an unpaid college basketball player. Um, Who's privileged and thinking that you're privileged that you're sitting in those seats yeah. because you're a member of Sports Radio 810 as part yeah. of the media. And they, so then it gets out on, hey, the voice of sport in Kansas City, the guy from 810, yeah. look at him taunting this K, K-State basketball player. And it became a meme. And it was on every message it board on viral. Facebook. Oh, and I must have gotten, shoot. I don't know, 500 emails from angry K-State fans telling me exactly what they thought of me and um you know it was uh I, you know i got called out onto the carpet by all my employers for being stupid and putting myself in a position that would put their organizations in bad sure, light yeah uh rightfully so i'm not you know sure. feeling sorry for myself over any of it um and it was i mean yeah i mean it was it, it for a while there i thought maybe my career will be over because of this you know and the mm. dumbest out of all the stupid things i've done in my life mm-hmm. this could be the one that that ends my career you know and uh and just, you know, it, honestly, like getting all those emails, I responded to every email that I got and I apologized and said, look, I feel stupid about it. I'm sorry. Uh, some people accepted it. Other people were like, you don't mean it. You're just saying it because, yeah. you, you know, you're they getting, made you say that. Yeah. Because you, yeah. you, you, you feel bad that everybody's beating you up now and, and all that stuff. But um, it does hurt getting those, even though it's people that you don't know. And it was one of the things that I did have to. That was like a big learning moment, though. Like, I don't we can get when we get into the deeper stuff later, mm-hmm. every every. Uh, every moment of personal growth that's ever happened in my life has come as a result of the deepest pain that I've felt. Really? And this one is not the deepest pain I've ever felt, but it was up there. I mean, from mm-hmm. a, it was a traumatic moment in my mm-hmm. life. I mean, it still kind of gives me, I, I, when I go to therapy now, we work on techniques on how to calm myself down when this episode in my life comes up because it, it, it triggers. Do you feel anxious right now talking about um, it? I'm getting better. I'm okay. getting better at it. Um, But it, it did cause me to understand if you're going to be in a job where you're in the public eye, yeah. people are going to have opinions about you mm-hmm. and you can't control what every single person thinks about you. Mm-hmm. Um, you got to do your best to try to live a good life and and be the person you want to be and square yeah. it with yourself and realize that some people are just going to hate you. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I don't, that doesn't mean like I, I, I I'm trying to find the right words. Obviously, if I had to do it over again, I would not have done what I did. Sure. I feel stupid about it. I right. beat myself up like crazy about how stupid it was mm-hmm. and not seeing how I would have come across to everybody, you know, mm-hmm. um, when I when I did it. And um, and, and there will be a part of me that that will get thrown back in my face for the rest of my life. Anytime KU and K-State play each other in a big game, I'll get a few tweets from people and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. And the picture well, and the still out there. Li- lives, it'll never die. Yeah, <laughs> but, but, it, but it caused me to understand, like, you, you got to, you can't live your life um concerning yourself with what people who don't really know you think of you exactly you you have to live your life looking at the man i mean the old michael jackson look at the man in the mirror man Mm -hmm. are you okay with yourself and if you're not you got to take a really hard look and make some changes and that caused me to look in the mirror and say okay why did i do what i did Mm -hmm. how do i feel about it i had to sit down at the dinner table with my kids because my kids were getting grief from kids at school you know about hey your dad we don't like your dad anymore um and Mm. and that you know i had to sit down and and, but it gave a good opportunity for me to own my behavior in front of my children and say look your dad's not perfect either i do stupid things sometimes i make mistakes i'm gonna try to learn from them Mm -hmm. And, and, but you know, one of the best things that came out of it, Jillian, was guys like Ronnie, yeah, especially K-State fans. A- as many emails as I got from, from K-State fans that were really upset with me, I got people like, had people like Ronnie who reached out to me and said, Hey man, keep your chin up. You're, yeah. you're, I- I've been, I've been taking your back. I know what kind of guy you are. Yeah. I know you're a good dude. Mm-hmm. Sure. And you just don't forget. Like it was I, Stephen St. John actually said to me after it happened, he said, you need to take it, take a real solid inventory right now of every person that has reached out to you in support and everybody that's throwing you under the bus right now. Yeah. Because every one of those people that's throwing you under the bus right now, they were just waiting for the opportunity. They were always ready. <laughs> but everybody that's got your back right now always had your back. Right. And now they've all kind of showed you their cards. You're actually yeah. kind of lucky. Now you know where you stand with all these people. And you can be friends with all of them, be nice mm-hmm. to all of them. But now you know there are some people that will, even when you do something stupid yeah. that's somewhat indefensible, they still care about you. They still love you. Yeah. And you did that. He, he did well, that. And and I did, you could have you know. left with that or you could have left with considering that a worse moment and then letting that define you and be yeah. like, well, I, I screwed up. That's my career. I'm, you know, and then like, like let that kind of take you down and down yeah. and down, you know, yeah. like you could have let it tear you down. Yeah, you can. 
People do it all not. the time. Right. People do it all the time. I didn't bring that up just so you know, and I know you know this, but for anybody who's listening to put myself on the back, that wasn't what it, the, the intention was. I just know that because I and you have worked, we've all worked in radio. I, I can personally say that I have subjected myself for doing some really stupid things that I was concerned that I was going to get fired about mm. or over. Mm-hmm. And luckily there was, well, one, either I over was overthinking it way too much or two, I was given a lot of grace mm. and the ability to recognize my faults mm-hmm. and move forward. Mm-hmm. And because I had worked in that limelight and had done some stupid things and I, you know, as a K-State fan, I was disappointed, mm-hmm. if I'm being honest, that that had yeah. happened. But I had had a relationship with you and knew the type of person you were and knew that you felt the regret. And I felt the regret before I even turned on the radio. I saw the meme first thing in the morning. I hadn't listened to a second of the morning show. Mm -hmm. I had texted you the picture just to kind of flip you a hard time. Yeah. And it was not even you. It sounded like you wanted to throw up in your text message. Like you were so regretful. You apologize. I was like, bro, that's okay, man. Not a big deal. And then I started going through my feed and I'm, this thing is showing up more. How long ago was this? Three years ago? It was 2019. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So Mm. four years ago. Um, But what had happened I'm, I got to be careful about how I say this. Let's just say that there is a person who was employed by the Kansas State Athletics Division, whatever. Okay. Um, maybe his voice was used okay. frequently. And he went on a tirade about Nate and how he should be fired immediately. And it pissed me off. Mm. And so I publicly, without that I'm anybody special and that anyone's going to listen to what I have to say, but I went to your defense as a K-State fan on that forum because I knew what that felt like. Like, man, I've made those mistakes before and, yeah. and gosh, am I going to lose my career? Am I going to have to start all over? What is this going to look like? And so right. um, I just wanted to lift you up, man, and know that you, that, that this isn't going to yeah. be the end for you. And, well, it meant a lot, you know, just yeah. any, any, and, um, one of the things that my therapist is working with me on is that if I can learn to be more forgiving of myself, then I have a better chance of being more forgiving towards other people. Mm-hmm. Sure. And I definitely think it's something that as a society, we could stand to grant everybody a little more grace. Yeah. You know, um, we, we, and, and I, I don't know that it's anybody's fault in particular, other than we're just kind of designed to get whipped up into a frenzy. Mm-hmm. You know, we see a little clip of some video that somebody sends us and it's intended to make us mad and get us fired up. And, mm-hmm. and that's what we do. So, you know, yeah. I, 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 um, Hey man, I, you know, a lot of people felt like I should have paid a much more serious price than I did. I feel like I pay, I paid a good price, you know, um, for something stupid. And yeah. I, I try to learn from it. I think that if anybody looks in the mirror truly or opens up the closet of skeletons, they're, they're all have done something stupid or foolish at one point in time. And they're like, yeah. in fact, I was going to bring this up too. And I'm not sure what level of comfort you're going to have talking about this, but uh, you know, uh, people who are sports fans in this town are going to know this name. One person who did come to bat for you because I heard it live on the air was Kevin Keatsman, who is a K-State guy. And he told me that, or he didn't tell me, he told his listeners that he had had a direct conversation with you about that. What do you recall about that conversation? Yeah, I mean, I, there were a lot of conversations that were had the next day, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, as all I remember, he felt like I should have been suspended from the radio station oh. for, a, for a while. Um, and he, I think he felt like there was a double standard that KU fans could get away with something like this. That is been not what I heard on the air. Yeah, it, he, he told me that. You know, that's what he told me. But he also said he felt really bad for me mm. and that he knew I was a good guy and that, you know, he, he knew this was going to be... He had known because of the what the, the abuse he would get from KU fans all the time how things were going to go for me from the K-State fans, you know? And, yeah. he, and, he, and he sympathized with me over that. Um, you know, he's like, look, this is going to be tough. You're going to get... You're going to get it, you know, and Mm -hmm. I've been there and I know how it feels. And he gave me a hug, you know, and, but he did, he felt like I should have been suspended. I don't know how long, uh, you know, I don't know how long he thought it should have been, but, uh, what level of, because he had some sort of part ownership in the company, right? Yeah. He was an investor and I don't know all the details of who, but he didn't really have any say in the outcome of that. I guess not enough. Not because it didn't happen. Yeah. What do you have a relationship with him now? Not, not, I mean, we've, we've communicated a couple times, um, but not really. I mean, and it's not like it's one of those things where I don't want to talk to him or he doesn't want to talk to me. I think we've just kind of, he's doing his thing. I'm doing my thing. We, mm-hmm. we got together. Actually, the last time I remember getting together with him was actually I, I coordinated a Zoom birthday party for Don Fortune. 
Um, oh, yeah. and, uh, and, and, and I reached out to Kevin to see if he wanted to be a part of it. And he joined in and we all wish Don fortune, a happy birthday. It was like, you know, during the pandemic and Don's living in Florida now. Mm -hmm. And so we had a pretty good back and forth then we've texted a couple times. Um, we've texted a few times back and forth, but I, I wouldn't say it's like, we don't get together a lot, you know, anything like that. Hmm. So his dismissal from the radio station, how awkward was that for everybody that worked there? And if we, you know, for those who don't understand, you know, uh, Kevin Keatsman, the former afternoon personality for Sports Radio 810, WHB, uh, I don't even know how long ago it was, three years ago, two years ago? Uh, no, it had been yeah, more than two years ago. Anyway, uh, made some, do you know anything about this, Jillian? No, so, I know who he is, but I don't, I don't right. know. Right. So there was the whole issue with Tyreek Hill and basically what his character was because of some of the litigation that he was going through at that time when he was a fairly new member of the Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah. And basically, and I, you correct me if I'm wrong, but the way I perceived it after hearing it was that Kevin insinuated that there was some sort of wild asylum happening at Arrowhead because Coach Reed, Andy Reed, had a son who was employed by the Chiefs who had some let's say a shady past or it had run into some legal troubles oh, in the past. Yes, and so yes, that yes. caused an uproar. I think that uproar. was four years ago. Was mm -hmm. it 2019? It was, yeah. it was, it was very, it wasn't very far after what had happened with me in the K state thing. Okay. Oh, that's and, probably true. And so yeah. I don't really, to be honest with you, Ronnie, I don't want to talk too much about that because that's fair. Uh, this was my, m that whole situation was very much colored by what I had just gone through. Yeah. With the K-State thing. That's fair. Yeah. And um, I didn't like the way that I had been treated in some ways by some people mm -hmm. with, with my situation. And I had told myself, I'm not going to react the same way. Mm -hmm. And I just stayed away from it. Fair enough. You know, and, and people were, were calling me a coward on social media for not chastising what Kevin had to say. Um, and, and I was getting emails from people saying that this, you know, this is gutless on your part. You should be taking a stand against what Kevin said and all this stuff. And I just said, you know, my only response was, man, I have a tough enough time answering for the stuff I do in life mm -hmm. and the yeah. things that I say, I'm not going to get into trying to justify what somebody else is doing or, or castigate what they're doing. Mm -hmm. You got a problem with what he said, take it up with him, mm -hmm. you know? And I just kind of wanted to leave it at that. And I don't know if it was the right place or not. Um, you know, I, but that's just kind of where I came down, you know, and, 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 and my old producer, Jake Gutierrez, he, he was the one that taught me this phrase. He'd say, man, if I would get to griping about what somebody else was doing in the building, for example, and he would say, man, I'm just trying to keep my side of the street clean. Yeah. I got mm. enough on my plate to keep my side of the street clean. I'm not going to worry about the other side of the street. But don't you, you think know? that you, you like, I mean, I don't know, maybe not it just in life in general, whether it's, it's work or personal life or a friend group or whatever. Don't you feel like that if that, if the Keatsman thing had happened two years prior to you dealing with, you might've handled it totally yeah. differently. Yeah. And so, and, yeah. and then your guy you're talking about now that, 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 that was his response. He obviously dealt with something prior yeah. where maybe he was mistreated or mm -hmm. something. And we just, might get to, to find out what that is. Yeah, actually talk to Jake. Yeah. I talked to Jake over the weekend. And is we're he going to come on? Yeah, I think so. That show's going to well. be way more interesting than this one. <laughs> just telling you right now. So that makes me think of something I was going to ask you about only because of something that has been in the news the last couple of days that you probably haven't talked about on your show. But then it made me think about all the drama around Patrick Mahomes, family, spouse, brother. Mm -hmm. Do you even, do you even touch that kind of Jackson? Yeah. Are you talking about Jackson Mahomes? Jackson and Brittany and all that. Like, do you even touch getting off the topic of sports and going to sports families and it ends up being kind of tabloidish and like the, what the, what happened this week I'm sure you, Eric Decker but he's not even relevant in the sports world right now but like his wife did you see that story no okay well it, ridiculous I saw a story about a baseball player whose wife had to pick up popcorn that's what it that was. was okay, okay yeah, so yeah that's, that's Bass, Jesse Anthony James Bass. yeah that's Jesse okay. James Decker is married to Eric Decker who okay. played for the Broncos and the Titans and, what, and so the girls are sisters oh gotcha oh, and okay. so it was Jesse James Decker former country singer, I guess she's a country mm -hmm. singer still, like was like, my sister was so rudely, like, oh, so do you even? I saw that that tweet got 74 million impressions and yes. I saw this wow. is what we're worried about right I now. I know, it is This ridiculous. is what we're worried about. It is ridiculous. I mean, I just, I don't know. It's like, I guess if we, you know, get on our high horse and, and judge those things or judge 
Patrick Mahomes family, then it makes it takes. Then we don't have to think about the 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 mess that we got going on in our, our own side lives. Of the street, right? Yeah, yeah, we're not, our yeah. So clean. I get I get to make myself feel better than than those people yeah. if I if I judge them or something. Kind of the Jerry Springer effect. Yeah, we don't really. <laughs> me and Steven don't tablet. really ever talk about Patrick's family. I mean, we every once in a while it it, it might come up briefly. Yeah. Uh, and we might make a little small joke or two about it, but in general, I don't know. I I don't. It's his family, man. I mean, what do yeah. you? Like, first of all, what do people want him to do? Yeah. And second of all, like we don't know them. I, right. I, I you know, I guess we see some stuff that's happening in the news about Jackson, and it's not flattering. Uh, I've been around him a couple times. He was fine when I was yeah. around him. Sure. I I don't know. Like I don't know them. I I don't I, right. to, to like because I guess that was another thing that hit me with the stat sheet thing too. Is I mean, I have people tell me that I was just a rotten human being. Sure. And I thought, okay, I did something really stupid. Yeah. But. I love my kids. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm faithful to my wife. Yeah. I I I feel like most of the people that know me would say I'm a good, loyal, honest friend that's not perfect. Right. So like you saw a th- six second clip of one of my stupidest moments and yeah. you're judging me as a human right. based on that. And I, because of that, I, I don't want to do that. Right. I don't know Jackson Mahomes. Right. I don't know what he's going through. I don't know what his struggles are in life. Mm. I don't know what it's like to be the brother of the greatest athlete in the world. Yeah. Well, and then I, you, you know, go, like I, I just, I'm not, I, somebody else can judge him and sure. I, I'm just not interested, you know? Sure. Or you start thinking about your own family and go, okay, well, if, if you reach that next level, if you're Patrick Mahomes, but, or you're you, but you're at his level and you're like, well, what if they start picking on my family? Like, who are they going to pick? Like you go, and they will. everybody's got people around them that aren't perfect either. So I just wondered if that was even something you guys touched on the radio or no. We talked about that popcorn incident just from the standpoint of, (laughs) should you clean up your popcorn on a plane? Like we, we didn't tell me most people said, yes, clean up your kids. (laughs) Yeah, we did. We did. But, but I will say this on the flip side. (laughs) Yeah. I've never been five months pregnant with two kids on a plane. Yeah. I've traveled with my wife and little Mm -hmm. kids and it is a nightmare. Yeah. I will say that. It's It's a nightmare. It's not easy, right? Everybody could probably have stood to give each other a little more grace in that whole situation. You know? Well, and nobody knows the whole situation, (laughs) right? Yeah. I don't think putting the flight attendant on blast is, and and trying to like mess up her career is the right way to handle it either personally, but whatever. Yeah. (laughs) I agree. You know? I agree. Yes. Uh, Unless you just want press, right? Right. Eh, Maybe that's Well, you're getting some press with your backyard. Yeah. What in the world, ESPN? Uh, Do you know anything about Nate, the the famous backyard of Nate Bucati? No. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm going to try to get some imagery and I'll be putting it up in the video version of this podcast, which again, you can find on YouTube or Spotify. But Nate (laughs) does this thing in his backyard where he makes it look like Arrowhead, like the field, like Arrowhead Stadium or the soccer field at Sporting Kansas City. Do you have a do you like, maybe have a quick picture you yeah. can pull up so Jillian yeah. can do you like see do you it? get George Toma to come do it for you? No, he does it. I oh, do you it myself. Do it. Yeah, I he paints the hand. lines yeah. and does and and so his kids what? obviously the whole neighborhood wants to show up and play football in their backyard. He gets out there, plays football with them, and I so think my own kids kind of think it's lame. Like the neighbor kids all think it's great. You know how it you're, is. Oh yeah, right. You know, you're um, you're not cool to your own kids. No, no. I, I, I think I it's hope, so cool. That I hope someday cool. they'll look back on it and and uh, you know. Think of it very fondly. I'm I'm trying to find a good. So one. Here. So the re- I bring it up because this recently was the video that made that went viral. Here yes, is my uh, son. Um, but anyways, you can see the end zone cool. there. Can you so. text me that video? Yeah. So when when, when, when wow. we can do it later, but I want to put that into so is it, the video. Is it decorated now or decorate? What do you call it? Like, is it groomed now? Well, I've 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 had. <laughs> This is how nerdy I've gotten with this whole thing. Oh, no. I've oh, had to boy. patch up a lot of dead spots of grass because it got chewed up during the football season, which sure. is how I want it to be because I want the kids, I want kids out there playing on it. Right. Um, so I've been patching up all the dead spots and, um, and then I, and so once that gets grown, yeah. it'll be a soccer field here again, pretty okay. soon. So I did even like, so during Super Bowl, I painted the end zones gold because the chiefs had a gold end zone in the Super Bowl. And I put the Super Bowl logos at the, yeah, you did. You know. how much yeah, you money did. do you spend in painting your oh, back? God, yard? I don't know. I, so do you want to know the backstory on how that started? Sure. Um, and this, this goes and back. By the to, way, we've got about, because you got to leave by three, we you yeah. do two, so we got about twenty ish okay. minutes, and then I want to so get I'll into just, some yeah, other I'll try deep this stuff real quick. But this goes back to the men, uh, we're we're going to get into mental health stuff and all yep. that. And I told you yep. that yep. the biggest personal growth comes from the 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 hardest moments, the biggest mm-hmm. pain in my life. Mm-hmm. The pandemic was hard in, individually for me because I'm a big extrovert and mm-hmm. I don't like to sit at home alone. I like mm-hmm. to be out doing things and and interacting with people, and so. 
I really hated the lockdown part of it. Mm -hmm. My wife was working in healthcare though. So we were very strict observance of it. Mm -hmm. And my wife is a saint and I, and she's a hundred times better human than I am. So I, I don't resent her for that at all. Like we had to do what we had to do. Sure. But so I was looking for ways to make our house a better place to be. If this is the space that we're allotted in the world right sure, now, okay. yeah. I want it to be a place where my kids can, it, where it's fun and we're not sure. just stuck here, miserable at home. And when I was a kid, my dad every once in a while would, would mow the backyard in the pattern of a football field by adjusting the level of the lawnmower. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I, when he would do that, I would get so excited. Oh, man, we're going to play football. <laughs> I'm going to pretend I'm on a real football field. Oh, that's and so cool. I did that in the backyard and I posted a picture on Instagram and somebody made a comment that said, you know, you can buy field paint on Amazon. Mm. Oh. So I said, well, shoot, let's do that. So yeah. I ordered a case of Amazon, <laughs> uh, a paint from Amazon, and I just took some stakes and string and just kind of eyeballed it and made a soccer field. Yeah. Okay. And so we had that for the rest of the summer. And then when football season rolled around, I thought, well, I bet you I could do a football field. Yeah. And I just started geeking out over it more and more. And then as I started doing it, by the second year I was doing it, I'm like measuring the field. <laughs> it's to scale. Uh -huh. Every five feet is one stripe. So that's 10 yards. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, and I, I started looking at the, the games. I'm like, okay, the arrow had actually, it's outlined in black paint. Mm -hmm. So then I started ordering black paint, you know, and then I started studying the font of the Chiefs across the end zone and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I just... It's like, and my wife just looks at me and goes, what are you doing? You know, but yeah. I think it's more for me than it even is the kids. Cause yeah. the kid in me gets to go out on my back deck I and see it. a football field back there. And right. it makes me happy. I thought it was so cool when I'm scrolling through my feed and ESPN cool. had, had posted it and you it made some reference to you throwing a dime to your son. Yeah. You, cause you had thrown that pass, uh, yeah. which was, was really neat. But no, I, I did want to touch on that because it was cool that ESPN shared that and wanted to get the back history on that. Um, all right. So. I want to dive into some deep stuff here okay. and I'm going to start with this. Um, again, we have 20 minutes left here. I sent a text message to Nate and Steven mm -hmm. on October 8th of 2021. Okay. I was diagnosed with depression and anxiety in January of 2022. Okay. Nate and Steven were talking on their morning show about Eric B enemy uh, doing a press conference and uh, talking about the mental health and the importance of being there as uh, support for Josh Gordon, okay. who was, um, for people that don't know, uh, a hell of a talented receiver in the league, played with the Patriots. Was he somewhere else after? The, I think he, he bounced around Browns, after the Patriots. Yeah, yeah. But, it, but really made a name for himself with the Patriots. And, um, and so basically, Nate and Steven were echoing the importance of mental illness or the importance of mental health and in bringing attention to mental illness. And I'm driving, I think I was actually dropping my kids off for daycare or something when I was listening to this. And it really, really resonated with me because I was going through such a difficult, confusing, dark time. And so I had text the Nate and Steven and said, Hey guys, this is Ronnie Phillips. I'm reluctant to send this text because it shows vulnerability, but I feel safe doing it because I feel like I know you two well enough to trust you, uh, trust you and know you're solid guys. For what it's worth, your validation of the enemy's comments on Josh Gordon went beyond the surface of being a sports fan, and I appreciate it more than I can explain. I've been battling some shit slash demons for a while, but more so uh, over the last year. I've tried to hide it, and that is exhausting and eventually has led to self-shame. Mm, it's still hard to talk about now. <clears throat> this isn't a cry for help. <clears throat> it's simply a thank you. Your comments lifted me up today and I needed that. <clears throat> it told me that I'm not alone and I shouldn't shame myself because deep down, I know I'm a good person. If that conversation had that kind of impact on me, there is no way I'm the only one. Your thoughts and perspective had to have had an impact on many others listening. Again, proving that you guys are genuine guys uh, with huge hearts that care about all people. Sorry uh, to get deep with you, but I felt, I can't even read because I got tears in my eyes. <laughs> I can't read. It's all blurry. Um, where did I leave off? I felt like you needed to know that it had an impact on me <clears throat> at that time and I needed to hear it. Have a great weekend. And then, of course, um, Stephen and Nate both replied. Um, and at that point, Nate had shared with me that you had 
been also, and we didn't get into it in that text message, but we've shared a little bit since then that you have uh, been dattle, battling some anxiety. And so I want you to talk about it to the level, to your level of comfort, uh, comfort. But I do feel like, um, as you know, this podcast was inspired because of what I went through an effort to no longer internalize what I went through to challenge myself to be open about it and intended originally to be medicine for me. But what I found is that being a person who's got some little notoriety that by being vulnerable and sharing my story, it gives other people hope and it has resonated with others and helped others. And so I'm hopeful at whatever level that you're comfortable sharing it, you could have that same impact on others as well. Well, that was a very powerful moment when you sent that text. And, and we got a lot of text messages like that from different people, people reaching out to us. And sometimes on the morning show, you don't realize who's going to be listening, how your words are going to affect them. And it's kind of like a reminder, like, oh, what I say mm-hmm. does kind of matter right it now. It matters, yeah. Um, for me personally, I have had a tendency to worry myself sick, literally. Um, I've, I've ended up with an intestinal infection um, that my doctors always said was about your diet and, and diet matters. I'm not saying it doesn't, but in this particular instance, my wife, who's a physical therapist and I, I, it, I, I've gotten this, this infection like three, four or five different times over the years, the, the 17 years I've known my wife. And they would always say, well, p- keep track of what you were eating. Cause it's, it's a, a little, it could be nuts. It could be seeds that get into your intestinal system and get stuck in there. And that's what's causing this infection. Hmm. And there was never, a, there was never a similar thing. I was like, well, I'll cut out all the nuts and seeds and everything. And then what happened? Hmm. And my wife finally one day said, there's been one common denominator every time you've had this intestinal infection. And it's a serious type of infection that can cause you to have to have part of your colon taken out, you know, if mm. it wow. doesn't, wow. you know, if, if, if you don't get it under control. So it's something I need to take very seriously. And she said, there's been one common denominator. Every time you've gotten this, you have been incredibly stressed out and worried about your future. Mm. And the first time was when the Royals, I was traveling with the Royals, and they were losing 100 games every year. 810 was upset because they were losing boatloads of money on it. The Royals were upset because I was working at the radio station that was trashing them on the air all day, every day, because oh, yeah. they were terrible. Yeah. So the Royals were mad at me. A-10 wasn't happy with my job. And I had just met the woman of my dreams. My wife is absolutely the woman of my dreams. I mean, like, I have recurring nightmares that she wakes up and tells me she's going to leave me. Um, I haven't had one of those in about a year and a half, by the way. But that's happened for, you know, that's happened off and on. Wow. Um, and... I knew I wanted to propose to this gal. And I was one of those guys that thought I'm probably never going to get married because I'm never going to meet the type of person that meets the level Mm -hmm. of what I feel like I need to, to commit my entire life to him. (laughs) And I knew I wanted to marry her. And I thought my career was about, I was, I'm always like sure that my career is about to go up in flames every minute, any minute. You know, that's another one of the constant fears I live with is this career that I wanted my entire life is going to evaporate on me any minute. And I was, I was really thinking that that was going to happen at that time. And I worried myself sick Mm. and I've done it. Then when my dad, my dad almost died of long COVID, um, November two years ago now, whatever. And, uh, I was, he was, he was long COVID. So I was able to visit him in the hospital because he didn't have COVID anymore. He had all the blood clots that came after Mm -hmm. it. So I was able to visit him in the hospital. So I was spending hours in the hospital with my dad who was this close to dying and getting emails from everybody in my family trying to tell me what to say to him to help him, you know, wake up and, um, and, and, and trying to deal with all that stuff. And mm. I, I got the in- infection, I worried myself sick. Wow. And, and there was, there's, I could give you the other examples, but it was, it was those moments. Always those times, yeah. It was anxiety. It was anxiety. I worried, I literally worried myself sick. And when I start to feel moments of anxiety now, I feel the pinch in that same part of my intestine coming on. Wow. Mm. And my wife has taught me to, to breathe through it. Now I'm, I am seeing a therapist to try to work on managing, you know, uh, all the anxieties that I feel um, in the world. And um, my wife being a physical therapist is what made destigmatize what destigmatized mental therapy for me mm. because 
I, as, as I've told you, I mean, she's calling me right now. She can probably hear me. Um, um, <laughs> That's why she's the woman of your dreams. I, I, honestly, she can I, I, it's, it's obnoxious how much I revere this person. I, she's just an incredible human being. Oh, and she I has taught that. me that physical therapy is also mental therapy. Yeah. You know, your brain informs everything that your body does. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, so when she's trying to get you to rehab your knee, she's actually tra- training your brain too, to understand what you're feeling sure. and why you're feeling it. Because your brain misinterprets data all the time. It misinterprets. It might tell you you have a hamstring injury because it's feeling, it's getting a nerve signal and it's misreading it, you know? Mm -hmm. It's just like your brain misinterprets, you know, my my, my intestines are in, you know, involved with me being stressed out, right? Mm -hmm. And, um... I honestly, I, I will admit, man, when I was growing up, I had to go to counseling. Some of my parents got divorced and I resented every second of it. And I thought mm. it was a waste of time. And I thought it was for people that are mentally weak, that you need somebody to help them solve their problems for mm-hmm. them. And, uh, cause you know, in those, and we talked about it earlier with soccer, you don't show weakness. You don't exactly. show that you're, yeah. you know, like somehow that's a sign of <clears throat> toughness is to pretend that you've never been hurt, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, or to pretend that you don't need help sometimes. Yeah. Right. And, and that's just a farce, you know? And, and so anyways, I going through all that and being married to my wife, and, and her teaching me, you don't have to have an ACL tear to benefit from therapy. Sometimes you just have a sore back. Yeah. It's not devastating. It's not, it's not something that's going to require surgery or lay up for six months. Sometimes you need intensive therapy because you're dealing suicidal depression. Mm-hmm. You need somebody right now. Yeah. But sometimes you got a bad back or you got some anxiety. Right. You're worried about things. Why? And, and, and like... Um, the idea, I'll use that analogy I told you earlier from the jujitsu class. I yeah, took. perfect. When I was laying on my back in the first jujitsu class I ever took and the guys got on top of me and that's where they start you. Now, what are you going to do about it? And my first reaction was to push the guy and try to roll away from him. And the jujitsu instructor said, this is like life. The man on top of you is a problem right now for you. When you have a problem in life, when you turn your back on it like you just did, does the problem go away? No. It's now got control of you because mm-hmm. now that man has your back and he can choke you out in a second. You've got to turn and face your problems in life. Mm-hmm. How much braver and tougher is it to actually own mm-hmm. what you're going through, mm-hmm. that you're vulnerable, that you can use help, and to attack the problem. And for me, it's like, okay, now when I feel that pinch in my intestine, I understand where it's coming from. Yeah. Mm. And it actually calms me down because instead of freaking out going, oh my God, I got to get on antibiotics again. And, um, uh, you know, it, it, I, I could end up with, a, you know, having to have a, you know, a colon surgery. And, and, then, and then you start worrying more and more and it gets worse and worse because you're freaked out about it because you don't understand. But yeah. now I'm like, okay, I'm stressing out about some things that I can't control right now. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I need to be okay with the fact that I'm not in control of everything that's happening in my life. And I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. And you know who taught me that more than anybody? The last, one of the last episodes I had with this, right before the pandemic. This is great. I know you're, we're running out of time, but this is a good one. Um, we were pregnant with, uh, with our third child. Okay. My wife and I had had two kids. And we had decided six years later that we wanted a third. Mm -hmm. And so we, we went for it and everyone that we were friends with said, what are you guys nuts? Are you crazy? (laughs) Like you just got out of the diapers and all that stuff. And now you're going to be broke the rest of your life and everything. (laughs) And then right about that time was when the news started coming out that major league soccer was going to take the broadcast rights away from the local markets, which Mm -hmm. I had just made this big career pivot to go to sport in Kansas city. Right. And I would have done that the rest of my career if I, if, if I had been you know given the opportunity and now I'm, I started stressing out going, okay, my wife's about to have a kid. Yep. What is going to happen to my career? In 18 years, I'm going to have another kid to try to help get through college. Yeah. All this stuff. I don't even know what my career is going to look like in three years from now. And I worried myself into one of those infections. (sighs) And two things really gave me clear perspective on why that was so stupid. First of all, Jake Gutierrez, who you guys are going to have on the podcast, I told him I was, he was one of those guys I could talk to. I could say, man, I'm in a bad place right now. I'm, I'm freaked out. I'm worried, sick. I'm literally worried, sick. And he turned to me and he said, when are you going to realize the powerful entity that you are as a human being? Mm. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, look at the life that you have right now. The wife that you always talk about, she's the woman of your dreams. You married exactly what you wanted to marry, right? I said, mm-hmm. yeah, your career. You want to be a sportscaster since you were 10 years old. You're doing it right now, right? Yeah. And I said, and I'm worried about losing it all. 
And he said, so what if you did? You've already built the life you envisioned for yourself once. You, of all people, should know you can do it. Yeah. So if it was all ripped away from you tomorrow, why wouldn't you have any confidence in yourself that you could vis- envision whatever the next part of your life is going to look like and put it together for yourself? Hmm. You've already done it. You know the roadmap. You should have all the confidence in the world that no matter what happens, you're going to be okay. Mm-hmm. And man, that hit me hard. And I, every time I start, because I do, I still have, my brain tends to go worst case scenario every time. Okay. What if this doesn't work out with Major League Soccer and they dump me on the side of the road and now I'm out, you know, I got to find something else to do. And every time I think about that conversation with Jake and I go, I don't know how it'll work out, mm-hmm. but it'll be okay. Mm-hmm. And here's the thing then, you know what happened a month after that conversation the world shut down because oh. of a pandemic that I wasn't even worried about, that I didn't even know existed. Right. My entire world, everybody's entire world was turned upside down. Yep. Something I was spending all this wasted energy worrying about something that might happen three years from now yeah. when something way worse was coming a month away. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we got through it, by the way. Yeah. You know, and and but so you none of us know what's around the corner. That's yep. it. And so if you spend all this time worrying about what might be around the corner. The stuff that is actually around the corner is going to hit you, you know, and blindside mm-hmm. you, and you're going to have to deal with it anyway. So anyways, that's, that's, um, that's a little bit of my story about how learning to, to be like, yeah, I'm scared a lot. Okay. Yeah. I feel anxiety a lot, you know, and mm-hmm. um, how do I manage it? And uh, I'm glad we're at a place now where we can have conversations like this. Me too. And I think more and more people are realizing that's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. Mm-hmm. You know, having, being willing to be vulnerable and put your heart out on the table in front of somebody else. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing that, man. Um, <clears throat> what kind of, uh, how many sessions have you I've been only through? Had two sessions. Two so sessions. Yeah. And they're so I got, it's going I'm well. I'm loving you like it. it. I'm are? loving it. But I realize that I'm just getting started. You're just skimming the surface, aren't you? Yeah. My therapist, I don't know, she's either going to love me or hate me because I got notebooks full of things I want to go over with her. (laughs) Oh my gosh, that's great. (laughs) I've got pages and pages of things to sort out with her, so we'll see Like you're giving her homework. Like if you could just take this home and read it before our next session, it'd help us out probably. Yeah. (laughs) Well, we got five minutes left. I wanted to ask, so what is uh, the plans for Sports Radio 810 and yourself and Steven as it pertains to the NFL draft? Oh, it's going to be amazing. Steven, Steven's going to be hosting some major party every night from here till through the, through the draft. He you likes know? the party. Well, but he's also, man, people love to be places where Steven is. It's true. You I know? love to be around Steven. He, he just, he's got that infectious uh, personality and energy. So he, and, and he's, he's locked in on the draft. I'm going to be hosting um, the, the stuff on Wednesday and Thursday night in the power and light district. Okay. Um, and I just hosted a, uh, an event last night with Tim Grunhard, Christian Okoye, and Dante Hall, which was really fun. Oh, yeah. cool. And, and obviously, we're going to be carrying the draft live on A-10, wall-to-wall coverage. We got guys that will be at Arrowhead, guys that will be down, because that's where the war room is for the Chiefs, mm-hmm. and then guys down in the at Union Station. I'll be in the Power and Light District. We're going to be all over the place kind of trying to cover it from every possible angle we can. What an event, you know? I mean, once in a lifetime. So if you ain't going to be at Union Station, come find Nate at the Power and Light District. And as we close this thing out, I would like for you in whatever time you want to allow, because you know how quickly you got to get out of here. But I love how much you uh, try to, on the air, talk about your friend, Sean Biggs, and the foundation that you have. I would be remiss if I didn't give you this opportunity on this platform to promote that. Okay, so th- that, I guess the theme that I've been trying to hit, and this is going to be in my book someday, and uh, if, if there's something I want people to take away from it, is to not be afraid of the pain that you will suffer in life. Okay. And for me, now maybe it's easier for me to say this because the, the, the greatest pain I've ever suffered in my life was when my front, friend Sean Biggs died of cancer uh, 10 years ago now. Okay. I wear this wristband. The last time I ever saw him, he gave me this. He was from Abilene, Kansas. Um, He went to Kansas University with me. He went to MIT to grad school. He was 36 years old. He had a five and six-year-old at the time. And I had just become a a young father at that time and was learning what the magic of parenthood is at that age. And Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that his kids were going to be ripped away from the opportunity to grow up with their dad and get to know him and that he was going to be uh, robbed of the opportunity to watch his kids grow up. Uh, was was devastating to me. And at the at the wake um, in Boston, 
his daughter was five years old and she went up to the casket and was screaming at the casket, daddy, wake up. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it just was, was the, it, that's the deepest pain I've ever felt in my life. Mm-hmm. Um, and watching Sean's mom kiss his casket and say goodbye, sweetheart, as, as, as they, you know, buried him. Um, that pain caused me to start a charity foundation. Something I never, I had no experience with. I don't know how to run a charity foundation. Sure. I don't even, I didn't, it was a, it was a year long process of me calling people, figuring out how do you do it? What, what do mm-hmm. they look like? How do I get a 501c3 set up? What's the, what are we going to do with our money? How are we going to raise money? What's the purpose of it? All these things. And uh, 10 years later, the Sean Biggs Memorial Foundation's raised almost a million dollars to help people battle cancer. Way to go, Nate. Um, more importantly than the money, I have an incredibly close relationship with Sean's widow, Neha, who lives in Chicago. Millen and Simran, their kids, are high school age kids now. Mm-hmm. This past summer, I went and played golf with them in Chicago. With, with Millen, wants to be a college golfer. Wow. And Simran plays tennis. And I played golf with Millen and tennis with Simran. And we all went to dinner together. And we are incredibly close to this day because of all this. Mm-hmm. Um, I am prouder of what has happened with Big Steps than any single thing I've done in my life outside of being a husband or a father. And the reason I'm proud of it is not like, oh, pat me on the back, but it's been the most rewarding. I've gotten more out of it. And I would not have done all of this stuff. And honestly, at this point, like we we did a 5K, 10K every year for the past 10 years. We're working on the next event because we put a stop to the 10K after the the, the race after this year. We did 10 years. I think we're going to do pickleball. Okay. This seems to be a new hot thing right now. But we've all, the the guy, and we have a board of directors that have done just as much as me. I'm not taking any, like, I'm not taking all the credit. The board of directors have all done every bit as much work. They were all people that were close to Sean and were hurt. But we don't have the emotional energy. We don't feel the pain that we did, that it took to do all that. It, I needed to hurt really, really badly yep. mm-hmm. in order to do something like that. And so my point is what the range of human emotions, joy and pain and, 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 and fear and optimism and happiness and sadness, mm-hmm. all that stuff, you have to feel it. Yeah. And if you feel it, don't be afraid of it. It's just what you do with it. You know, when you hurt that bad, what are you going to do about it? You know, what are you going to do with all this terrible energy that you have stored up inside? Are you going to use it to do something to make your life better? Yeah. Or are you going to let it eat you up and, 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 right. and tear you down? And, and so that's my message. If you're feeling pain, yeah. you know, it's okay. It's okay to feel deep pain because if you use it the right way, it will, let's just like they say, you know, like when is the, sur- the soil the most fertile is right after a forest fire. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, and that's, that's my message. So whatever it is that you're going through in life, it's all right. And, and use that energy to make something beautiful happen as a result. I heard somebody say, I don't know, remember who it was. I think, I think her name is Lisa Harper, a teacher. And she said, um, that pain is a promotion. Now yeah. you have to welcome that. Yeah. You, yeah. you can sit in it and you can, yeah. you know, you can not yeah. let it be, but. Do but. you know who Eric Thomas is, E.T., the, the hip hop preacher? I don't. He's uh-huh. the guy who's got the story about, well, it's a long story. Not, we don't have time, but it's, <laughs> it's, 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 check it's him out now. you got to check him out. He's yeah. intense. He's one of those motivational speaker yeah. guys. Yeah. But um, he tells this story and the end of the story is when you want to breathe as bad as you want to succeed or when you want to succeed as bad as you want to breathe, Mm -hmm. that's when you're successful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's something that I've kind of lived by. Um, But he also uh, says something in that in that story that don't cry when you have failed, you know, don't cry when you've lost cry when you've succeeded you've already fit you've already got there you know get a reward out of it mm-hmm. yeah and and so i It'll think that's it, it it kind of all falls together man we talked about so much i mean this is mm-hmm. like i love these kind of episodes because it covers all of the things that i selfishly love sports personal <laughs> development human uh, or rather mental health and and vulnerability and everything dude um I know that we're not like super close like you and Steven, but you have always been a great friend to me. I love you like a brother. Thank you for always taking my call, taking my text, taking my email. Thank you for driving all the way across town to be here and a part of this. 
You're welcome here anytime. Jillian, I apologize that I've completely dominated with this. She came into it. She goes, well, you know, you're the sports guy. We're, you know, I, like, go, I go, I assume we're talking about sports. Yeah. And I'll just, you know what? I got my, I got my little sports. drink and my, I'm good. Uh, yeah. Send my best to Steven. The Heartland <laughs> premiere is coming up on yeah. June 17th. The golf tournament um, is coming up on June 16th. And so we'd love to connect with you soon Let's to maybe go. come in on 810 and yeah. promote that and try to raise some money for peace partnership. So thank you. Oh, one last thing. We're going to make this worth your time in some capacity. Brown oh, yeah, Piercy, right. Brown Piercy Cattle Company, uh, who is a proud sponsor of the Papa Ron podcast, is going to give you a gift box, a guest gift box for premium thick cut steaks, four of their famous steak burgers, two family size roasts and four pounds of 93%. Lean ground beef, man. Thank you very much. You got awesome. it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jillian. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your support and everything that we do here with the Papa Ron Podcast. Send my best to everybody over at 810 Nate Bucati. Tell Stephen I said hello. We we'll hope to see you soon. That's going to wrap it up for this episode 36 of the Papa Ron Podcast with Nate Bucati. You've been listening to the Papa Ron Podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, hit subscribe now on the podcast platform. Follow the Papa Ron Podcast on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. And while you're there, like, comment, and share. Until next time, thanks for listening to the Papa Ron Podcast. The Papa Ron Podcast. The Papa Ron Podcast.